Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first day of two days discussing Regen Brisbane. My name is Michelle Maloney, and I'm really delighted um, and somewhat slightly confused too to be handling a hybrid co uh, call today. So it's delightful to see um, a lovely group of people here in Brisbane um, at QUT, Kelvin Grove, and also want to say hello to um, the 30 folks or so who are joining us on Zoom. My name is Michelle Maloney, as I said, I'm the co-founder of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, and I also work with Marcus Foth inside the New Economy Network Australia. And Nina is a network of people trying to shift the economic system in Australia from a growth-focused, human-centred way of being towards a system that cares for country, cares for people, um, and works on a whole range of issues across a network across Australia. Um, Marcus and I are your hosts today, and we're going to be really giving you um, a whirlwind tour of a whole range of different issues to think about if we want to start um, engaging with this new momentum around regenerative um, practice. Regenerative everything seems to have replaced sustainability of everything from the 1990s. We're very interested in that, but we're also critical of it. Um, just whacking regenerative in front of your old job title doesn't actually make the world a better place. So today we're going to be exploring different notions of well, what is this regenerative stuff? How can you call yourself a regenerative designer or a regenerative economist um, or a regenerative land manager? Um, so what I'd like to do first, I'll get hand over to Marcus um, in a moment to show the lovely video that this university um, has permission to use to welcome you to country, but I would like to acknowledge country as a non-Indigenous person, um, born and raised in the middle of Queensland, now living and loving in Brisbane. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal peoples on whose land we live, work and play, and to pay my deepest respects to Elders past, present and, and future and emerging, um, and really my um, humility in front of the oldest continuous culture on earth and the remarkable opportunities we have to work together and learn together. Um, and in a moment, I'll be introducing Mary Graham, one of my favourite people ever, and she and I are working on a whole range of things that are um, really focusing on helping non-Indigenous folks like myself understand Indigenous philosophy and culture in a deeper way, hopefully to make us more regenerative. Um, but over to Marcus, who might like to also introduce himself and then um, show the little video. Thank you so much, Michelle. I got to hold this microphone a little bit further away so I don't blow through the speakers here. Uh, I'll... Um, at my acknowledgements of, of country, QUT has produced a video that features our elder in residence, Uncle Sheg. And so I will have to touch this very sensitive audio visual setup to bring um, you that video and I hope that's um, gonna work. So bear with me for a second. Bauka be bauka. Welcome in the language of the Yagara people. We acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagara peoples as the first nation owners of the lands of where QUT now stands. For thousands of years, the Turrbal and Yagara people have gathered along the banks of Maywaka, the Brisbane River, to share their knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognise that these lands where QUT now stands have always been places of teaching, researching and learning. We acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within our QUT community. From Moreton Bay, inland as far as the Great Dividing Range near Warwick and Toowoomba, as far north as the Caboolture River, including the lands around Brisbane City, Mianjin. Yura yura yinala, barka bi barka, ngangura ngura maramakura nganyabirali nganyabayam. Welcome to the traditional country of the Turrbal and Yagara people. Thank you, Marcus. It's a very beautiful welcome. Um, we did invite Yagara and Turuba folks to join us, but I'm sure, as you know, they're very busy and in demand, so they weren't able to join us, but send their greetings, which is lovely. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce um, Mary Graham, but before I do, even though we started a little late due to some technical issues, um, I would like to speak with you about the program 
Um, if you, if I'm always frightened to touch the buttons at the moment, um, I'm going to share the screen and show the program. And that's the slide. No, I'm not going to do that. I think it's okay. I'm sure you're familiar with the program because you're here with us today, but let me tell you what we've got for you. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, what we're going to do um, rather than 10 minutes is do a five minute interactive survey. Um, it's the beginning of just finding out why you're here and what you're interested in talking about today and tomorrow. But let me just remind you about the program. Um, we're going to be moving through a number of different um, what Westerners might call multidisciplinary themes today. Um, and I hope that you'll find that interesting. I know I do. Um, we'll start with some really deep and, and important wisdom from Mary Graham. And if Yin doesn't join us, um, I'll be able to share um, um, some recordings that he and I have done in the past on some of his material around decolonizing our minds, which is really terrific. Um, and then I'm really delighted because we'll have Jonathan Shree from the Brisbane City Council um, in the, the Gabba ward coming to talk to us about his perspectives on what Brisbane is up to in terms of sustainability and regenerative activities. Um, and then John I will be here um, for morning tea if people have any questions for him. Um, and then hopefully we'll be back on track um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about locating Brisbane within its natural ecosystems. What we have been finding is a lot of regenerative talk talks almost primarily from a human centered point of view. They start with some kind of discussion about a circular economy, which when it's been greenwashed, is really looking at recycling and materials use, or it's looking at one aspect of regenerative design or planning. What we're interested in through the regen process and building on the scaffolding of a program that we nicknamed Green Prints, because it's like a blueprint, but it's focusing on making our earth a greener and more beautiful place. Um, because we're building on that scaffolding, we wanna start with a more deeper connection to place and a really open and honest discussion about what ecological limits mean for all of us and what that means for any kind of regenerative future. Because our argument is if you don't connect our material consumption and our livelihoods and our activities to the capacity of the living world to support us, then we're really doing what we've always done um, in Western societies, which is kind of live up here in a very disconnected way. So our approach to regenerative everything um, is definitely starting with a different way of thinking, not perhaps the way different to how you think, but different to how our modern economic, political and cultural system uh, thinks about the living world. So that's going to be a fun session and I'm delighted that we've got um, Rachel from Healthy Land and Water, Kira May from the Belimba Creek Catchment Coordinating Committee to talk about the realities of caring for place and caring for this living space of our city. Um, and then if all goes well, we can play a quick game of biodiversity bingo. Um, it's just a way to help everyone actually remember who else lives in the city other than the people. Um, and then we'll be talking a bit about our city's impact. Um, and I'm really delighted that um, Delwyn Jones, a director from the Sustainability Assessment Group, uh, the EVA Institute, who I think is one of the leading thinkers in the materials side of how do we rethink sun concepts like life cycle analysis and things that might make folks get a bit snorful until you realize you can't actually be regenerative by thinking about it. You actually have to do stuff about it and it's our material impact on the living world that is one of the ways that a non-regenerative way of being manifests in this current system. So that's a very brief overview and for those who are here with us, um, we will be offering morning tea and lunch and afternoon tea. And exactly as Mark has said, please be respectful of space and uh, masks and all of the other limitations uh, that we're working within. And um, I was actually feeling a bit snuffly when I was coming here wearing my mask in the back of an Uber and then remembered most of Australia's in lockdown. Revel in your snuffleness, I thought, because at least I'm coming out to meet with some good people today. So... Um, Sound is working, things are working, we're back on time. This is delightful. Um, I actually can't see Yin on the line. So, uh, oh, he is there, hooray. I'm here. Hello, Yin, how are you, darling? I problems, but I'm here. Oh, we're so glad to see you. You look so cold. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could join us and we'll hand over to you in one moment, but first I'm going to introduce Mary. Um, Mary, are you able to unmute yourself, my love? Yeah, sure. There yep. you are. Hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Thanks so much for joining us, Mary. Now, Mary Graham will be here with us in person tomorrow for our workshop. So those who've signed up for the Friday session, um, you're very lucky because you'll be with us and with Mary. So um, I am just going to add a spotlight. Very good. So um, the session that we're going to um, listen to now is all about the relationist ethos 
how Indigenous people uh, use the relationist ethos and develop this wonderfully deep philosophy to create, in effect, one of the most regenerative civilizations that's probably ever existed in terms of longevity um, and depth of love of place. So um, Mary's going to talk about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a quick five minutes for questions. And if you want to ask more questions, then you should come along tomorrow. Um, and then we'll hand over to Yin, who I'm really pleased um, can join us as well, because he comes after Mary to really remind us what thinking differently looks like and uh, how some of us in the Western tradition can learn from other cultural traditions um, about perhaps improving some of the things we're interested in. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, um, Mary, um, okay. I'd like to let you introduce yourself in the proper okay. way, but I will just say that you are an adjunct associate professor at the University of Queensland in the Department of Political Science um, and a Kombu Mary and Waka Waka person. Um, and uh, I'm very delighted to be working with Mary inside a new organization called Future Dreaming. And Future Dreaming also supports, if anyone's connected to uh, that wonderful launch we had a few weeks ago of Regenerative Songlines Australia. Mm. Um, Mary and Anne Paulina and other Indigenous elders are leading a truly um, insightful and remarkable process that it's um, an honor to be part of. But enough of me, over to you, Mary. Thank you so uh, much. Okay, thank you. Um, so as, um, as Michelle said, I'm, uh, on my father's side, um, Yugambe region down here on the Gold Coast, the, the language is Yugambe and I'm Komba Mary. On my mother's side, she was a Waka Waka uh, from the, what they call, well, it's a Burnett River district, three, 400 kilometres northwest of here, of Brisbane, I mean. Um, and I guess always, I usually always start off with the idea of, um, of not just how long we've been here, but that Aboriginal, you know, Aboriginal people, I mean, been here, um, how we've, um, what kind of development that we've had uh, in relation to um, the land. So it is all about relationalism. Um, the, it goes like this, the land has invented us. It's actually the creator, actually, but not a godlike creator, but it's created us. So in a sense, you could actually say, um, that it, you could look at it in a scientific way and so, see that what we've simply done is sacralized the whole process actually. So the land has invented us, it's grown us up. That's, they actually use that term older, uh, as I was growing up, hearing older people say that, the land here, uh, no matter how old it is, uh, we are and, and so on, but it's grown us up. So it developed us, grown us up, developed us, looked after us um, and continues to look after us. So it goes something like that, that there's two relationships, the land, uh, the relationship between people and land, and then the relationship between people. And that one between people is always contingent on the relationship between land and people. So you, le you learn, you, you've, le you've learned over the, like millennia um, that um, that's the first kind of relationship that you you can possibly have um, so it because it continues to look after us what develops is a kind of custodial ethic so we're obliged forever to look after it not that it needs looking after it doesn't need us at all but we do look after we have to look after it not damage it not exploit it uh, not uh, be careless about it and, and so on and so on so it's the center or meaning, if you like, um, of everything, uh, of all of life. Uh, that old saying, I think, therefore I am. The Aboriginal version is, I, I am located, therefore I am. All meaning comes from this place we're in, you know, and so on. Um, so not, so as not to take up a, um, a what do you call it? A um, survivalist ethos. Survivalist ethos is where you're seeing land purely as a survivalist uh, tool, basically keeps us alive and so on and so on. Uh, we can get resources from it, um, all kinds of things like that. And if we don't own and control it, um, we, we have to fight for it, to own it. And really you can't own it. Um, so a survivalist ethos takes a very hard view of, of survivalism. So. We're all relationalists and survivalists, but when you take survivalism too far, um, uh, human relations get quite dangerous. So you, you have to take relationalism 
into an ethos, a meaning of life, a philosophy of life, if you like, and care about something outside of ourselves, which is land. And then that becomes a template for the kind of social and political ordering system that we should have. Uh, a steady state system, I like to think of it as a state, a steady state system, which is usually used in chemistry, but it's um, uh, it, it can withstand all kinds of shocks. It a steady state meaning it can keep it, it can be knocked about a bit, but then it keeps keeps going and so on. And and this is what looking after land helps human beings to do. Actually, you you simply can't go wrong. So the big question though is, do do we have the capacity to to um, change what needs to be changed? You know what needs to be. I always think of self-correction, not not self the individual self. I mean, I'm talking about social correction, like it's like doing a U-turn. That's what the experts are now asking us to do, isn't it? You know, um, to, to a, do a U-turn like that and just go back to, you know, forget about um, the you know corporations, uh, government or corporations, which is currently the system in the whole world, basically and governments being the handmaiden of corporations and so on and so on, um, actually replace all that by looking after land and alternative systems and um, all, all of that. Um, uh, for that, it might help to have a different uh, logic to uh, a logic um, that is not of the arena, which I, I tend to think Aristotelian logic is. It's like the logic of the arena, whoever wins is right, you know, and so on. Uh, our logic is all perspectives are valid and reasonable. So you look at a system called autonomous regard. You take care of um, the interest. You're, you're aware of the interests of the other and you treat each other in this uh, a fair way, uh, not an exploitative way, not a controlling way or anything like that. So autonomous regard, we're all autonomous, um, um, but we have to have regard for each other. Um, nature itself is autonomous we have to treat it as not where we are not the dominators of it and also we're not the slaves we're we're, we're not worshiping now in other words we're not worshiping our nature nothing like that at all we're making sure we're not doing any damage to it in our lives so it's not anti um technology uh it's not anti uh it's not anti in any way of course but it's the 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 concept of looking after of what you could call a um, oh well um, a uh, sacralized uh, ecological stewardship system that's what's got to, got to come into being and because white people are a lot of white fellows are some people are Christian or you know uh, or not Christian or anti-Christian you know so um, if um, People don't like the word sacralized because it sounds too religious. People, you know, people who are atheists or humanists or, or capitalists for that matter, <laughs> if they don't like the word sacr sacralized, uh, leave it off and just have ecological stewardship. Do you know? Um, so we're essentially, if you're looking for a meaning of life, that's probably the best one to be, is to be a steward of the, of the country, of the earth. You know, you can have a personal meaning of life, but a general all purpose, collective, social, philosophical meaning of life is looking after the land, looking after the earth and so on. And actually doing it though, because ethics is a doing thing, you know? So we have to discover or rediscover an ethical identity for a, a stable society. And uh, starting with land, of course. So I'll leave it there. Is it all? Thank you so much, Mary. Um, as always, you're so efficient with time as well. Um, and we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone wanted to ask Mary a question, I'm now going to see if a hand goes up in the room or if somebody in the chat would like to write a question. Um, and the one thing that I would like to comment on is um, I love how Mary always talks about it's a it's a pretty nice uh, meaningful purpose is just to be caring for the earth. It's certainly um, fulfilled my life so far. Yes, we have a question. I shall translate a question for you in a moment, Mary. Okay. Oh, she can hear it. Okay, you may oh, hear right. it. 
Hi, Mary. Thank you. Oh, um, yes. Bill Jones from Tambourine Mountain. Oh, right. Yes. You mentioned a U turn mm. in the field I'm in. That's exactly what we've discovered that we have to be able to make a U turn, measure mm -hmm. where we came from, and measure mm. how to get back to where we need to go. So, mm. thank you for that because that's very reinforcing for what we're trying to do. Mm. Good. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you, Mary. And in fact, you, someone in the chat also said um, a similar concept, but a question too. Alice said, do we have the capacity, do we have capacity to change what needs to be changed? Do we have the capacity to make the social correction? This is the heart of the question right now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I just, absolutely. That's one of the big things that we're working on at the moment, actually. And um, you could start off in all sorts of ways with, with the land itself, of course, of actually going out and doing it and so on and so on. But I think we've got to, at some point or other, we can't avoid the social and political ordering system has to be not just tinkered with, but actually vastly changed. And one of the best ways I, I can think of, well, it wouldn't be easy, um, but because uh, it would engender lots of arguments, but is to have a, a non-hierarchical society and an, uh, an agendered, agendered um, governance system. Aboriginal, pe Aboriginal system, old systems are gendered. There is such a thing, or was and is such a thing, men's law and women's law, men's spirituality, women's spirituality, men's uh, business, women's business, and so on and so on. So both ran society. It's a flat system, not a hierarchical system. It's flat, and men and women are you know, you have to run it together. So my idea was just start off in a small way <laughs> by every every committee and board in the whole country <laughs> could have uh, half men and half women. You could always have uh, dual chairmanships. Don't, have, don't go back to single chairmanships unless it's a women's organization, of course. But even there, it's a good idea not to have a hierarchy don't have hierarchies, avoid them like the plague, I would say. Um, so men and women as being um, that, um, as, as being in, go in governance. Um, and you could start off in that small way, you know, um, and just let it roll out. So don't, don't theorize about it. Don't um, feminist theorize about it either. Just do it. Just start doing it, you know, in that way. Um, we will so, talk a bit more about governance in our workshop tomorrow. Yes, so, um, yeah, that's right. yeah. Some of the work that Mary and I are doing um, for a book um, that we're exploring what future law and governance could look like if we built it on the relationist ethos in Australia. Yes. So mm. that's going to be exciting. Got another question for you, Mary, and we've probably only got time for one more. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, sorry, the chats are moving along nicely. Somebody asked um, about time. Um, can you speak to how we would change our understanding of time and what length of time we should be thinking about for our stewardship? Oh, gee. Well, first thing is to, I suppose, realise about time is the different ways of looking at time too. Um, that thing that I said before about, um, you know, I think therefore I am. Um, uh, and uh, we're located, therefore we am. Uh, we, we are. We, the meaning comes from a location in land, but meaning also comes from an event in time. That's a location too. A location is an event in time too. So you have to have um, a, a multi-dimensional sense of time. That would be, that would help. <laughs> um, uh, lineal time is just one way. Just one of those many systems. Um, the, it's circular time. That's the most important. Circular. So it goes round. You, you have a chance for renewing. This is the idea about, um, you know, capacity for change, to renew things. So look at things in a circular way. Don't just look at before, now, and after. You know, or past and present, future. You know, uh, because you're, it's, it's like you're locking yourself in. So, um, yeah, just I, I don't know if that's that's good enough or but it's different views of time, especially multi-dimensional time. You know. Mm. No, thank you, Mary. Look, with the time we've had available, that was a wonderful answer. Um, could I please invite everyone to do a huge thank you to Mary, either in the old-fashioned way or whichever Zoom way? <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, thank you, love. If you'd like to stay on and have a listen to Yin's talk or if you need to go, um, we're very, very oh. grateful for you 
Yeah, time. I'll stick. I'll stick around. Yes. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow. Um, okay. Your workshops first in the day, so probably about ten fifteen. We'll be kicking that off. So. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks so much, Mary. And now um, I'd love to introduce uh, Yin. Yin Paradis is a race relations professor at Deakin University. Um, and has shared some really important insights into the whole process of decolonization, challenging modernity, and in fact, indigenizing cultures in their own uh, local places. So Yin, I can see that you're in the car. Are you all good? And um, thanks so much for making time to be with us. Yes, no worries. Uh, my uh, phone tower is down at my house, so I've driven down to the next tower. Oh. And uh, hopefully that'll work. We're very grateful to you for making that effort. Um, so over to you, Yin. I did, I've made you a co-host in case you wanted to show any slides. I've got some slides, yep. Lovely. I was going to get onto my slides because there's quite a few. Okay. All right. Um, slideshow from the start. Okay, I'm going to talk about decolonizing ourselves on a journey towards a regenerative, regenerative world. Uh, this is me, I'm a Wakai man, uh, Professor of Race Relations, Deacon Uni. Yeah, that's probably enough about me. Um, so let's start with colonization. This is every country that Britain has invaded in the history of the world, not the ones in white. Let's give you a moment to, for that to sink in. This is the problem that we have. We, we're facing the problem of colonization and colonization is a monoculture, dangerous in its own right, but also it, its nature is not regenerative at all. It's very different, uh, as we'll see in the upcoming slides. This is what the sort of situation that we're in now and the kind of uh, diversity of views really about it. So there's the everything is awesome view. We've never been healthier, happier, wealthier. We have washing machines in Africa, mobile phones that work probably better than my phones. Who knows? Uh, we need to protect our way of life. We have education, we have democracy, we have modern medicine. That's a story. It's actually quite a powerful story uh, that still exists in our, in our society. In contradiction to that, of course, is uh, the mental health crisis, unaffordable housing, mass migration, climate change, big pharma, economic disasters, food, water insecurity, uh, and, and essentially the promise of progress that's not being realized for um, certainly uh, the youngest generations uh, in our world who can't get long-term secure jobs or afford to buy a house, for example. And this is the kind of deeper analysis of the modern promises that we've been made and the colonial processes that underpin those. So we have capitalism, continuous economic growth, wealth accumulation, based on exploitation of the human and the non-human and dispossession of the human and non-human world. That's the colonial process underpinning the modern promise. We have nation states which promise us uh, belonging, uh, security, cohesion, but actually uh, perpetrating all sorts of forms of state violence, both within and beyond their borders in the maintenance of those borders. We have a sense of universal reason that crowds out other knowledge systems like indigenous knowledge, which we'll talk a little bit about. We have all sorts of hierarchies everywhere, uh, not the flat egalitarian societies that Mary talked about, but the extremely hierarchical societies where our worth, our deservedness is based on our status in various forms. Extraction, of course, infinite consumption, growth, needs that seem to be infinite sometimes. And of course, it's wreaking, uh, it's basically murdering the planet. Uh, Probably won't successfully murder the planet, but will certainly um, end human civilization and possibly our species. Separability, so the idea that we are individual, independent, and have unrestricted autonomy, which is a complete denial of the interdependence of life and the accountability or the responsibility that we have for that. Some key words that I think uh, sum up the colonial modern patriarchal white supremacist society that we live in. They're not fun ones, but there's a lot of this going on. People usually have questions about a couple of these, which uh, we can get into in question time. And what's the opposite of colonialism? Well, you could say it's indigenization, but sort of, yeah, there's 
there's, there's some reason in that, but really decolonization, obviously. And what are decolonial perspectives that are different from colonial perspectives? Here are some. Nothing is complete, perfect or enduring, but all is alive, sentient, profoundly relational and deeply sacred. We are immersed in unsensed worlds, which we can strive to sense, inhabit, perceive, co-mingle and grow with. We are invited to outgrow the often unquestioned need to obey, conform, judge, repress, which stunts our ability to express, to create, to connect and play, to belong. We are called to conscious, embodied, loving, reverent co-liberation with each other and the living cosmos. So these are some decolonial perspectives that are very different from how the fundamental values of our society that we live in now. Of course, we also have indigenous perspectives and Mary's already talked about different approaches to time, circular, rhythmic, cyclic time, where the future can be remembered, the past is yet to come, and now is a spacious, textured kind of every when, completely different from linear clock dissected time that we run on. We've got clocks everywhere reminding us about linear time. And both holistic alongside either or binary thinking and a focus on wisdom, humility, respect, generosity, response, ability, and not just knowing, but being and doing in many senses. You know, in our Western societies, we focus a lot on sight and hearing, but there are many other senses. Combining reason, emotion, intuition, imagination, connected, embodied relationships with all sorts of life, including country, which is all sorts of life within a living cosmos. Here are some words that would capture decolonial, um, indigenous in some ways, perspectives, which are very different from the other keywords uh, I presented earlier. And what would a society look like? What would a regenerative decolonial society look like? Well, here's an example. A movement from extractive economies or societies to regenerative economies or societies is about uh, relinquishing this idea of wealth and power, consumerism, extraction, exploitation, military industrial complexes, and moving through this process of drawing down. So drawing down power. Really, decolonization is a localized egalitarian flattening of hierarchies. So drawing down to the local, shifting control to communities, democratizing wealth and workplaces, um, of course, uh, better relationships with country, so ecological restoration, and, and kind of rest restoring of traditions, ceremony, ritual, um, connection, belonging, uh, presence in local communities. And there's a focus on caring and sacredness, well-being of various sorts, deep democracy, co-liberation or collaboration or cooperation, and of course, regeneration as well. Question from somebody. I knew that someone would ask this question every time. What is subsendence? So in a slide, I had transcendence as a form of colonialism. I think it is. It's a sense of escapism, spiritual bypass, if you want. How can we transcend beyond the planet, beyond Earth, to some other spiritual realm? Well, guess what? We're not going to another spiritual realm. We're here. We're material, discursive, discursive material. We are both story and substance. So we're not going anywhere. Let's not try. Let's instead of transcend, let's subsend. Subsend means not to rise up above the world, but to descend into it, to be grounded, to delve, to go deeper. That's what subsendence means. And when you subsend, you can, this quote is relevant, you can tap into the immense joy of, that comes from forgetting who and what we think we are and instead sense the gift of not being simply what we imagine ourselves to be now. So there's a lot to us. We have great capacity and capability for transformation, for metamorphosis, for catharsis, for all sorts of things beyond the colonial caging that we mostly exist in at the moment. So how can we actually do this? Action, not as Mary uh, has said, um, as Michelle mentioned, we gotta act, we gotta do stuff. And really I'm talking about relocalizing, creating, building, fostering, th cultivating community. So how can you create community? Community 
is the opposite uh, of hierarchical, oppressive, exploitative regimes that um, characterize capital colonial societies. So be part of community, create community, um, support things like universal basic income, which create community, local exchange trading schemes, and cooperatives, just, just so many opportunities for cooperative, cooperative work, cooperative play, cooperative creation, cooperative decision-making, participatory democracy. And it's really about rejecting the ideal of competitive success, living wildly, not um, domesticatedly, um, ca captive colonial way, in pleasure, but also with frugality, simplicity, and sufficiency, not the sense of, of ever-expanding needs, um, artificial scarcity, artificial um, artificial consumption that we're part of, that we're invited to be part of. It's about thinking local, lo globally, but acting locally. So a grateful, humble, ethical life that tunes in, heals and creates radical abundance. The world, the, world, the living cosmos, the earth, the living earth is radically abundant. We just don't, we don't see that. We're trained to not see that. For ourselves, for others, um, our indicating not belonging, uh, belonging, not ownership. And it's not going to be an easy process, obviously, to create regenerative cities or worlds or, or planets. Um, we're going to have to challenge power in, in some ways, not necessarily in the traditional ways. It can be through refusal to play the game, for example. We have to think about how we are in relationship with the country, how we're doing that in ways that are healthy, not exploitative, that are respectful. And we need to abolish a lot of economic exploitation that exists in our world and, and just economic stupidity. So stock markets, interest, commercial banking, subsidies, advertising, commercial advertising, planned obsolescence, which is an abomination, tax breaks, havens, shell companies, redundant trade, also an abomination in terms of the wasteful resources of the planet, you know, disrespecting the abundance provided by the planet. More broadly, it's about relinquishing debt, property, institutions, and nation states to overcome radical alienation from ourselves, other living beings, our work, and so-called nature. We need to unlearn reductionism, truth, rightness, power over, ambition, success, perfection, certainty, control, coherence, mastery, progress, virtue, validation, heroism, fame, merit, entitlement, duty, and sacrifice. Instead of those, how can we explore life beyond exceptionalism, human exceptionalism, exploitation, extraction, consumption, growth, and hubris, human arrogance that, that thinks we are a special species on the planet. And the way to do that is, is through, it's all about process. Here are some process suggestions from Indigenous and Black uh, groups. Create circles, not lines. So less hierarchy, more dialogue, more empowerment, more self-determination, deeper listening skills, the ability to, to learn from others plan with design with collaborate don't represent the whole representative system we have is is just is just harmful move at the speed of trust center the lived experience of ourselves deep dig deep into our lived experience our inner wisdom and seek people at the margins who have a great deal of discernment and wisdom especially about the dangers and the damage done by our our colonial capitalist system that we're in So it's an invitation to strive for societies that value self-realization, freedom, interdependence, care, love, connection, uh, celebration, beauty, grief, and cooperation uh, without institutionalized exploitative hierarchies that hoard resources produced by the labor of others. Weave networks of empowered local cooperative communities grounded in anarchy, degrowth, wilding, unschooling, permaculture, decolonization, myth, ritual, and ceremony that inspire authentic, creative, thriving, playful, vivid, visceral, plural, messy, vulnerable, sacred, sensuous, joyful, and senseful lives. And the challenge in that, of course, is to unlearn everything that we know. So very simple. And a lot of the things that we feel. So be uncomfortable with the unknown, the unexpected, the uncertain, the unthinkable, the imperceptible. Make unique mistakes in doing what is collectively needed beyond convenience, choice, or conviction. Metabolize our assumptions, aversions, complicities, contradictions, projections, triggers, and traumas. We have so many traumas in this world uh, because of the nature of our society. Discern, perceive, relate, and become without necessarily resorting to narrative, to meaning, to identity, to intellectualization, 
and certainly without judgment, comparison, condemnation, or justification. Questions? Jim. Um, I always love how you can so quickly um, summarise all that is um, before us as a challenge and all of the many ways we can rethink. I think I'm turned on. Yes. Oh, that's a, I don't mean it that way. I, my microphone is now on. Um, so we have some questions. I think we've certainly got some lovely comments in the, um, in the chat section here with people going um, that they love this. Thank you. Um, Someone, oh, good, thank you. And someone's saying that they've come across this term rewilding our hearts and they love that too. Um, we actually have a question from our wonderful next speaker, um, Jono from the Gabba. Um, yeah, thanks. Our Brisbane councillor. So, um, Jono. What's up, Yen? Thanks for an amazing discussion. Um, I'm interested in what you think are the most valuable or potent trajectories from the kind of extractive world we're in at the moment to a regenerative system. There are so many potential pathways of change. What do you think the most viable opportunities might be? Where should we be focusing our energy? Well, really, we need to be focusing on our energy on uh, love and care and compassionate societies. And that means we start with ourselves. So what do you do in life that is calling people in to where you are, that's sharing, that's listening, that's learning, that's being humble, that's being open. Uh, that's really it. I mean, and if you, if you do that well, many things occur to you uh, about the nature of our society that are abhorrent and disgusting and obscene. And then you get to a point in life where you simply can't stand those things anymore and you don't participate in them. Could I ask a question? Who is it? Oh, Mary. Sorry. <laughs> you can tell I'm juggling with all the different the voices. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I really like that love. Really, really deadly. Um, a lot of what you're talking about is what I'm calling, um, have been calling for a while or writing stuff on uh, autonomous regard, you know, the idea of that, exactly that. Um, but I've been also been working on something, what I, I don't know if. Uh, 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 well, about the idea of the possibility of developing or looking for or discovering an ethical identity. Do you know, everybody has all kinds of identities, straightforward name, name, address, number, you know, all kinds of stuff, um, politics, blah, blah, blah. Um, but but um, the idea of between a, an individual and society or the world, do you know what I mean? How do you live in the world? Because that's what you you're talking about and I don't mean it in the sense ethical identity of a moral philosophy or anything I, I mean it in the sense of being quite practical because I always struck me our Aboriginal people are very grounded you know people think it's all exotic the dreaming stuff and all that quite often but actually I've you know there's uh, Murray's are the most grounded um solid you know people um no mucking around, you know, <laughs> you know, anything but sort of far and away or anything. Um, and it just struck me that there's um you you just do ethics, you know, you just do it. Don't even call it something like that. It's uh do you think it's a possibility to even develop an ethical identity? Because it strikes me as when you're just saying that about love and all of that, you know, it's not about like becoming virtuous or good to be re rewarded because there isn't any <laughs> heaven. I mean, in the old sense, you know, the old sense, there's none, no hell, no heaven, nothing like that. Um, so it's a completely different world, really. Yes. Do you think it's possible? Oh, yes. I mean, we both know it's possible because yeah, it's, we been know it's, possible, but... it's been done for tens of thousands of years. But <laughs> yes. I entirely agree with you that I, do, I think identity is a thoroughly modern concept we don't have any need mm. for. No. I think morality, I don't believe in morality. No, no, no. I don't no. believe in it at all. There's no mm. such thing that's required. Mm. You need to feel into the mm. world, flow, mm. resonate. Mm. And it is every yes. day, every yeah. day there's like a hundred there's a hundred choices you can make every day. You can make mm. those from love and care mm. and connection and respect and mm. responsibility, or you yeah, can make right. them from a different place. Mm. That's what You're, ethics is. 
that's right you're in the world and you're with the world not just you're in the world and an observer of everything you're with the world mm -hmm. so it's hard for people that i think that's what black fellows did actually but it's hard for when old systems and i'm not talking only about white fellows or europeans or anything but barbaric systems turn people into barbarians you know if you have you keep having barbaric systems like jailing 10 year olds for bloody you know unbelievable i would say like jailing mm. anyone jailing anyone yes yes mm. yeah, absolutely mm. anyway thanks mm. a lovely lovely discussion we actually have another question um in our audience over to you kira it's it's on okay yes um, hello, I'm just wondering, um, with the, when you were talking about metabolizing trauma, mm. I've uh, read a book called My Grandmother's Hands by, um, I think it's Resma Menachem. Have you heard of it before? It was really helpful have, for me. I have heard of it before, only because um, Resma is in conversation with one of my favorite philosophers uh, in an upcoming talk, uh, Bio Okomolofe is having a discussion with him. Uh, about his book that's where i heard about it just a few days ago mm. but there is plenty of that's uh, i haven't read that book but there certainly is um there's some great books about metabolizing trauma about understanding collective trauma uh colonial mm. historical intergenerational trauma and also grief the process of going through the grief of understanding that so i think yeah it's a it's not easy there's there's it's a lifelong effort really to um to metabolize trauma but it's something we need to do Thank you. Thank you for the question. And one last question is all we have time for. Okay. Hi. Look, after years and years of being away, what I'm seeing you describing and what is terribly frightening is that what you're talking about is also being done internationally. And it's called foreign aid. It's called development. It's called assistance. Um, and in it, we pro promulgate the whole idea of capitalism and of, of overuse of land as the way that people in, in all sorts of traditional societies should operate. And I just wonder whether you've, you've been approached or whether you've had any influence on determining the direction that, for instance, AusAid takes in terms of its overseas contributions. And I use that word contributions with a, with a couple of in, sort of uh, inverted commas. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have been um, uh, approached by, let's see, certain people work in humanitarian space about um, decolonizing their work. And I think there's a huge amount of <laughs> uh, journeying to do for them. Um, the whole international aid system is fundamentally colonial and is based on the misapprehension that we have something great in the West that needs to spread to the rest, which couldn't be further from the truth. And it's also disempowering for people to be given things when in fact they already have all the things that they need. Most of the damage done by the West is in a constant exploitation of resources, sucking from the global South into our, um, and out into our pockets and actually the best thing we can do for the global south is get the fuck out of it. Thank you for that succinct summary, Yin. Always gracious. <laughs> All right. Look, um, we've now run out of time for this session, but I'm really grateful to both of you for joining us and for sharing some really mind opening ways of framing our discussions today. Yin, a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for welding so much um, into such a short talk. And Mary, always an absolute honor to hear you speak. So much to learn and can't wait to spend another hour with you tomorrow. So let's give it up for our awesome um, first panel. Yay for Yin and Mary. You're of course very, very welcome to stay here with us. Um, we're now going to introduce another wonderful speaker. Um, but just before we do, Jono, because we we're running a little bit late this morning, we didn't get everyone focusing in on the joy and wonderfulness of Brisbane. So what I would like to do just before Jono jumps up, we were going to do a quick couple of questions um, in the opening stuff. But we might scatter our questions through and um, discuss them in the session after lunch. So first of all, if you could write or type, I know it's mundane, it feels very grade three, but if you could, there's so much power in a word, can you just write down why you're here and what you want to leave with today that you didn't come with? 
why are you here? And in particular, not just I wanted to get away from the kids, but more related to Brisbane and Regen Brisbane. And what would you like to leave with that you didn't come with? But let's now um, uh, welcome um, Jonathan Shree, who is a councillor from the Brisbane City Council. Um, I'm sure many of us know about his really fantastic work and I better step away from him because I haven't got my mask on. Um, but yes, if everyone could please welcome very warmly. Thank you, Jono. Great. Um, everyone can hear me okay? People hear me online okay? Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much for the invitation and it's, it's a real honour to be here and to be part of uh, such an important discussion. My name is Jonathan Sri. I'm a local city councillor. I represent the areas so-called West End, Highgate Hill, Woolloongabba, Dutton Park. These places have their own Aboriginal names as well. I, I, I live in the area of Woolloongabba and I, or I, I work in the area of Woolloongabba and I live in on the waterway Culperum, which is the original name for Norman Creek. And there's also the uh, root word of the suburb Cooparoo, interestingly. But um, I think it's really important that our acknowledgements of country can't, shouldn't just be tokenistic and we're not just paying lip service to those discussions about decolonization and Aboriginal sovereignty, but that we really need to center those conversations in any discussion about transformation and, and the better world that we're all here trying to create. I'm particularly mindful that I'm a settler on this land and that I, I come from a, uh, I don't, I'm a person of color and I have sort of refugee heritage on one side of my family, but I also have white colonial heritage and that location and, and that influence on my life, I need to acknowledge as well. Um, and I pay my greatest respects to the elders of this place, the Yagra and Turbal peoples, and also thank you to Aunty Mary Graham for those excellent words. I'm, um, I'm not sure exactly how long I've got to speak. What is it, 20 minutes, Michelle, or we've been pushed at 15, including questions or sick, can do. All right, so I'm gonna run you through a little bit of some of the good stuff that Brisbane City Council is doing, but really want to highlight that we have a heck of a lot, long way to go and hopefully unpack some of what I see as the, the openings or the opportunities for, for positive change. I tried not to be too negative. I wanted to come in here and just talk about how awful Brisbane City Council is. I'm, um, I'm one of 26 city councillors. I'm the only Greens councillor. And uh, it's important to understand that Brisbane City Council is a very large and hierarchical entity. It covers a really large population and really large geographic area. And as a government institution, it has been wholly co-opted by neoliberalism, colonialism, capitalist extractivism, etc. Um, but within that big amorphous bureaucratic beats, there are small openings and opportunities. And just to run you through some of them, often they're specific projects, but they speak to emergent sets of values that I think are filtering through the public service. One example of that is the Hanlon Park restoration project. Hanlon Park is in Stones Corner. You might imagine a sort of long grassy park with a big concrete drainage channel running down the middle of it. You've probably seen them in parks around like 50, 100 years ago, someone decided we're gonna discipline that creek. We're gonna take away that natural waterway, which was Coolburham actually, Norman Creek. And we're going to straighten those lines and build in hard concrete boundaries. And um, it's pretty brutal from an ecological perspective and an amenity perspective. But what's really exciting about the Hamlin Park project is that they're reversing that. They're digging up that concrete drain. They're planting new native plants. The creek is being allowed to meander and, and flood. And there's kind of an allowance for, the, for that motion of water. And... It's a really exciting project and it's the sort of thing that Brisbane City Council should be doing a lot more of and I encourage you to look up Hanlon Park restoration project in Stones Corner you can see the pretty pictures and all that sort of stuff. Um, another interesting thing we're seeing in Brisbane at the moment is a few more bike lines have been built over the past few years. We went for, through a period of very little cycling infrastructure and after a lot of advocacy from a lot of people we've seen new bike lanes in my electorate of Woolloongabba, we've just seen uh, a little the beginnings of a cycling grid through the CBD as well, which involves taking space away from car parking and creating more room for cyclists. We're also seeing we've now actually just in the last month or two they're trialing electric buses in Brisbane, which is really cool. Those um, I think it's the Spring Hill Loop is the first route in Brisbane that's fully running on electric engines. Um, 
and the Brisbane Metro project, it's not quite everything that the Liberals are making out to be. It's not quite a revolutionary transport project, but the new vehicles are gonna be fully electric. Um, and that Brisbane Metro project also involves taking cars off some of those inner city uh, routes and roads and reprioritizing that space towards public transport. Um, we're also seeing on another frame, more support from council for verge gardens and urban farming in general. Again, incremental steps, but they went a few years ago from a position of being actively hostile to the idea that people could plant veggies in front of their house. And now we're seeing council saying, oh yeah, we're supportive of this. You can plant whatever you want, just leave the footpaths clear, which is a really good shift. And we're also seeing uh, pilots of community composting hubs and we're seeing uh, actually a trial has just been announced, hasn't yet begun, but of uh, dedicated collection service for food waste, which will then compost it in, on an industrial scale and divert it from landfill. So these are all really positive glimmers of a different kind of city and probably one that all of us are, are sort of broadly excited about. Um, even, you know, the little stuff like you'd expect, solar panels are being installed on the roofs of a lot of council buildings. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that we still have a very long way to go and that we need to be cynical of some of these projects to the extent that they might be used for greenwashing or they might be used as, uh, you know, oh, we pat ourselves on the back and say, we're doing enough, great job. Let our um, foot off the accelerator, so to speak. The reality is that Brisbane City Council is still spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year on road widening projects to encourage car travel and carry more cars. Brisbane City Council is still allowing property developers to clear native trees and build resource and energy intensive buildings um, that are, and those projects are largely motivated by profit rather than by human need. Brisbane City Council is still heavily regulating the use of public spaces um, to the detriment of marginalised people, pushing marginalised people out of public spaces while simultaneously doing nothing to address the city's rising homelessness crisis. Um, I only brought one prop. I'm, hopefully you're gonna be able to hear me if I put the mic down for a moment. Um, so I have here a bottle of water. Let's imagine that this bottle of water is the council's annual budget. Brisbane City Council has a $3 billion annual budget. Um, and so imagine that this is all the money that council puts into discrete projects, put aside the footpath repairs and the road repairs, which are pretty minor. But, as you can see, I'm filling up this glass, that one glass and probably another half a glass. Water bottle is almost empty at this point. That's how much Brisbane City Council is putting towards road widening projects. Um, it's a huge dramatic proportion of the council budget. Um, all that other stuff I just listed, the food organic waste composting, bike lane trials, public transport projects, that's, that's about what it works out to. Um, and if there's one more drop there, that last little drop is what we're doing to address homelessness. So um, that's where we are at the moment. It's, it's pretty bleak, to be honest. Um, and, and really, I think one of the core reasons for this is hierarchy. And our previous speakers touched on this. Brisbane City Council is an incredibly hierarchical um, entity. Out of curiosity, how many people here maybe apart from people in my ward, how many people here have had a conversation with their local councillor? Couple, you're, you're probably the, the rare few who are compromised that minority of really engaged citizens. Um, how many of you have had a conversation with the mayor out of curiosity? One or two, yeah, yeah. I can't get a meeting with the mayor. So, so you're doing better than me. Um, but each city councillor represents 40,000 residents. 40,000 per local councillor. There's 26 of us. There's no way a local councillor can meet with every one of those 40,000 residents. And then out of those 26 city councillors, six or seven of the senior members of the LNP are effectively making all the big decisions in our city. So decision-making is it's sort of centralised from those thousands of residents to the level of a sitting, single city councillor. And then even out of those city, those city councillors, decision-making is further stratified and, and that hierarchy is very, very strong to the point where if a big corporation is trying to influence Brisbane City Council to support a project or um, subsidise something they want to do, they don't even have to bribe or manipulate all of us city councillors. 
they only have to manipulate the Lord Mayor and one or two senior members of the LNP. And in that context, any opportunities for genuine bottom-up community decision-making for decentralized, localized projects are, are really sort of forestalled. So for me, getting involved and becoming a Brisbane City Councilor, a big part of it was sort of putting it into pr practice that idea of think global, act local, um, and with a particular focus on participatory democracy and how in practice can we decentralize decision-making. And I've written about this elsewhere, and um, I can share some links through Michelle later for those who are interested. But we've ex been experimenting with um, processes like community voting and participatory budgeting, which I've found a really positive exercise. Um, all the usual community forums and polls, et cetera, et cetera, but with a strong emphasis on not just consulting the residents of my electorate, electorate tokenistically, but actually empowering them to collaborate and make decisions collectively. And that's been a really interesting journey and an experiment over the past few years. And what we've seen, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that there's a lot of people who really want to have more say over the future of their city, but there are some very significant structural barriers uh, for most people to be able to participate in what we might call civic engagement. So if I call a public meeting to decide where the dog off leash area goes or to decide whether we want to set up a new community garden in this local park, uh, the same kinds of people mostly tend to turn up and those generally speaking will be upper middle class white homeowners and overwhelmingly i mean my electorate is probably 60 getting close to 70 percent renters now and the, the median age of my electorate is 31 so half the people in my electorate are under 31 this is west end kangaroo point Woolongab area um but if i hold a public meeting the median age is probably around 50 and um the majority of people who turn up own their own homes and are a little bit more privileged We've also been experimenting with forms of online voting and other kinds of digital engagement that are a bit more accessible and require less time involvement. And they do reach a broader range of demographics and a broader range of people. But the limitation is, of course, that um, those kinds of online voting tools don't facilitate the richness of deliberation and they don't give it as much space for people to hear different perspectives and take time to consider everyone's needs. It's kind of like jump online and vote for the thing you want and you've clicked a few buttons and that's your civic engagement, which also is an ideal. So I think for me and perhaps for all of us in this room and in this discussion, uh, we need to have a stronger, stronger emphasis on asserting the importance of decentralized, localized decision-making. It's great that Brisbane City Council's introducing electric buses. It's great that they're set, setting up compost hubs and all that sort of stuff. But many of those initiatives are still very top down and they're still very centrally controlled. Um, and if we if we get some of that, what you might call like those sort of so-called green projects and, and initiatives out, out into the city, that's great. But if they're still reinforcing old forms of hierarchy and if they're still, they're not directly challenging injustice and, and power differentials, then they're not really as transformative as they might seem at first glance. And they're too easily co-opted as, um, you know, greenwashing, propaganda where the council could say, look, we've, we're making a greener city. We're doing all this great stuff. Look at Hanlon Park. Look at our electric buses. Look at our bike lanes. When actually, um, overwhelmingly, they're still widening roads, cutting down trees and forcing homeless people out of the inner city. So I think one, one idea I wanted to leave you with in, in this room is the fact that perhaps our instinct, because we're positive people and we want to be talking about the good stuff and we're often told is to, when people are talking about how to be a positive agent for change, it's to celebrate the really good stuff. And I think that really is important. We do need to celebrate the restoration of creekways and we do need to celebrate the verge gardens and all that sort of thing. But there are already plenty of other people celebrating that as well. Uh, and we need to recognize that there are very strong corporate interests, multinational businesses, et cetera, that are dragging the city in, in a different trajectory. So we're right now, we're in the midst of a, a competition of ideas and competing visions for what kind of city we wanna become. We've got the kind of different, different species of green visions, um, green capitalism and degrowth and regenerative, all these sort of slightly divergent trends. Um, we've also got that sort of hyper-globalized neoliberal extractivism of an interconnected world where money is flowing freely and we just build more and bigger and consume more and more. We've also got overlapping that, that kind of fortress Australia mentality of Brisbane is just going to keep everyone out. We want 
we want their resources and we want the benefits of their labor, but we don't want the people. So there are all these competing visions. Um, and it's not enough for us to just be celebrating those few small good things that the council is doing. We actually do also have to have the courage to critique some of that bad stuff and push back against those projects and those trajectories that don't align with our visions. And I think, um, yeah, our sort of, maybe Yin touched on this a little bit with talking about forms of refusal and forms of action that um, can challenge the system. And increasingly I'm finding as a city councillor that uh, we do need to be willing to engage in civil disobedience. We do need to be willing to engage in prefigurative forms of activism that can be the change we wanna see in the world here on the ground, but also um, to block the bulldozers and to block the wrecking balls and to um, fight for the, the public spaces and the green spaces that are important to all of us. And so I, I guess my provocation to, to all of you here today is that it's not enough to just sit in the corner and say, yay, gardens, good job, Brisbane City Council. We also need to be a little more assertive in holding these institutions to account because I do believe that entities like, like local councils can be part of kind of the perhaps more sustainable and transformative and regenerative vision we're pushing towards. I'm very cynical of the nation state. I think we should be working to abolish the nation state, um, take away this whole idea of top-down centralized government, but we do need forms of localized decision-making and, and local councils might play a part in that. But right now, the way most local councils in Southeast Queensland are structured is that they are actively hostile to that vision and we need to find ways to co-opt and redirect that energy. So, um, I might leave it there and, and take a few questions, but thank you so much for listening and thanks to the other speakers who've been part of this conversation. Who's got the first question? Thank you so much, Jono. Um, some really excellent points there. And I guess many of us are very keen to ensure that our local councils are doing the right thing and are able to engage with democratic participation too. Um, I'm just gonna check the chat in a moment, but are there any questions in here in the room? from folks. Does Marcus have a question? Or, <laughs> yeah, go over. If you could, um, can we just take the council budget and maybe move it so I don't yeah, spill yeah. it? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Thank you very much, all speakers this morning, but especially Jonathan Shree. Because participatory budgeting has been a very important thing around the world, and in Africa, most of the participatory budgeting is done by the youth. So their populations, of course, this is before COVID, I'm not sure what it's like right now, but they changed the way that all those countries uh, did it. And then they brought that to the Commonwealth and we're a Commonwealth country. We've got uh, eight Asian countries in the Commonwealth and 12 Pacific Island countries in the Commonwealth. And we're one of the leaders and we should be looking after them, but we're not doing it ourselves. So yes, if you need help, let me... Just, let me find out how I can do that for nice you. One. So don't feel like you're on the back foot um, with your youth because you're probably more empowered than a lot of the other councillors. So that's Thanks so not, much that's that. not a question, I'm sorry. No, is it worth me explaining a bit more about what participatory budgeting is for those who haven't heard of that term before? Um, if you're interested, the system we've been used, you can, you can search for GABA Ward Community Voting, or I think it's communityvotingsystems.gaba ward. Um, you'll find it with a little bit of Googling if you search for my name and Jonathan, Jonathan Street and community voting. The process we use is to allocate a local parks budget. I have an annual budget of half a million dollars for playgrounds and footpath upgrades and that sort of thing. And instead of making up my own mind about how that money is spent, we invite suggestions from residents residents make suggestions, we find out how much they're going to cost. And then we say to residents, okay, you vote. How do you want to allocate that $450,000 between all these different eligible project suggestions that have come up? What we tend to find is that residents uh, prefer to allocate money to a whole bunch of really small local projects. Whereas what you would find if say the politicians were doing it is they'd spend all the money on one or two big flashy projects because that, that's what gets the headlines. Um, so participatory budgeting, I think, is a powerful tool because it decentralizes that decision making. It creates more space for people on the ground to say how they want their money or public resources to be spent. And, and you get some really interesting suggestions bubbling up from the bottom. Um, there is also a very important critique of participatory budgeting, though, which is that it can be used as a tool of neoliberalism to discipline electorates and narrow the parameters of acceptable debate. 
So for example, some governments or will say to people, okay, we've got this much money. Do you want to spend it on a new hospital or do you want to spend it on a new school? And it's like, well, we need both. And, and the political administration is forcing us to choose through this. It's almost like outsourcing the, it's like the political establishment has narrowed the parameters of debate, limited how much public money is available for certain projects, and then forcing the citizenry to make those difficult choices. Now, it's not tr true participatory budgeting. Really, participatory budgeting also needs to involve a conversation about revenue and how do we make big corporations pay, pay their fair share? And how do we, rather than just deciding whether we spend that half a million dollars on a basketball court or a new playground, how do we get the half a billion dollars that's spent on road widening and reallocate that? So I think participatory budgeting is a really useful and exciting tool, but we need to be talking about the whole cake rather than just dividing up a few crumbs, which is often what a lot of participatory budgeting projects around the world get reduced to. And so you see amazing examples from places like Porto Alegre in Brazil. Um, I could list off a whole bunch of jurisdictions that are experimenting with it, but sometimes it stops being the radical and transformative process that it could be and instead gets co-opted to say, yeah, how do we distribute the crumbs? Sorry, that was a long answer. Um, great answer. Another question? We've got time for one more because yeah. we do have morning tea, I hope. Um, Just up there. Hi, um, I just wanted to know your thoughts. I mean, we often talk about this move between the local and the global as a kind of scale, scalar imagination. Um, but when we're talking about regeneration and destruction, um, I'm just wondering how, uh, what your experience is. I've been away for 10 years. What your experience is of thinking uh, regionalism critically um, from a municipal perspective, because obviously in different locations, different kinds of councils have very different kinds of powers dealing with very different state governments. Mm. Um, and particularly with, you know, the scale of extraction we're seeing in certain places across Australia. I really um, am challenged by how we can get urban people to feel responsible for things that are happening in other places through digital campaigning, through signing petitions, through engaging with things that are happening in other states. Uh, I mean, this is a topic of a whole lecture in and of itself, but really good question. I, I'm continually mindful that the city might have a sort of physical footprint that's divine, defined on some map by where the buildings are, but the true footprint of the city is regional and, and international. The resources that are extracted in other parts of the world and shipped here, not just for our food, but for our building materials. So the, the footprint of Brisbane is, is global in, in different ways. And we have only have to think about the supply chains of all the products we use. But um, I, I even think about the fact that a lot, of the, the, a lot of the oldest buildings in Brisbane are actually made from the river. It's sand that was dug up and, and, and um, turned into cement and that's what we've built our walls and towers and bridges with and that's really interesting sort of idea to sit with that we're actually we're, the buildings don't sit on top of country they are country um, but increasingly those resources are coming from further and further away and it's a it's a really it's actually quite easy to mobilize people to think about oh that local park's getting bulldozed or um, and and much harder to motivate people to recognize that the food, where, where their food is coming from is having negative environmental impact, impacts across a region, for example. Um, I've been really interested. One campaign that I want to give a shout out to is Deep, Deebing Creek. So Deebing Creek is just south of Ipswich. And that's an area where historically it was an Aboriginal mission. It's a waterway corridor that feet, runs through Ipswich and into Brisbane. Um, and that there's now pressure to clear the forest there and develop it for suburban sprawl private housing. And Aboriginal people and their allies are actually camping out on site and resisting the developers. The development was due to start in early 2019 and they're still there. They haven't cut down a single tree that people are occupying. Now that's a land rights battle right on Brisbane's doorstep. People are actively occupying country, resisting the developers and the government and pushing off the police when they try and... But not many of us here in Brisbane are really conscious of that struggle, even though that commercial pressure for housing development is intimately connected to what's happening in terms of development right here in the inner city. And you have people in the suburbs saying, we don't want new townhouses, we don't want new granny flats. And so the government is building more and more housing further and further out. So there's a real 
close connection between what happens here in Brisbane and what happens in surrounding areas. And we, we lose sight of that too often. But, yeah, it's a very long conversation. I'm sorry I don't have time for it now. We're actually out of time. Um, I can't really let Jonathan go without giving him a 30-second, but really, really quickly, opportunity to talk about the Olympics. Um, <laughs> Brisbane has been awarded the Olympics. Um, it strikes me the Olympics is to a local city lot mayor what a spaceship is to a billionaire. Yeah. Um, so it's happening. It's unlikely that we can protest to make it go away. What are the opportunities for us to use this kind of disruptive moment to disrupt some of the hegemony, the neoliberal mm. kind of system, and use that um, moment to um, bring about a regenerative city? All right, I'll try and be really quick. Uh, it is it is an opportunity. We've got a global platform there to highlight the injustices, not just within Brisbane, but within Australia. And I, I know that already Aboriginal activists are talking about using that as a platform for sovereignty and land rights movements. Um, the Olympics is likely to be a kind of supercharged gentrification neoliberal capitalism project, but uh, we do have opportunities to resist or subvert that and, and push for an anti-capitalist Olympics as well, um, a resilient Olympics, a carbon neutral, all that sort of jargon. Um, but I'm particularly concerned about what the Olympics will do in terms of housing affordability. There's a really strong likelihood that people in inner city areas like Wollongabba are going to get priced out as rental accommodation is turned into Airbnbs, et cetera. Um, they're also going to be building a lot of new housing for an athlete's village, for example. And there needs to be a really strong push from people like us that that housing becomes public housing for people on low incomes rather than getting sold off to private developers. So I think there's too much to say about the Olympics right now to really do it justice other than that. Um, it feels like a long way away and we've got climate change and global wealth inequality and all these other issues to be um, focusing on. But the Olympics is going to be a fulcrum of a lot of different forms of activism and a potential, yeah, focal point for the kinds of changes we want to see. So, yeah, I'm going to continue to say that I don't think we should be hosting the Olympics while simultaneously looking for opportunities of how to make the best of it. And that'll be a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for having me in, and thanks to the organizers yep. for bringing me here today. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. So for everybody who's on Zoom and at home, thank you um, for joining us up until now. And we're going to have hopefully, oh gosh. Okay, can we try for a fairly quick morning tea? Um, it's our fault that we had the technical issues and started a little late. But if you could try for 10 minutes and come back in. Um, what we're going to do is squeeze the overview of the Green Prince Initiative at the beginning, and then talk about um, some of the natural features and wonder and beauty around our place before we get into other stuff. So thanks so much to all our speakers. Um, and let's head outside if you're here. And if you're at home, we'll see you in 10 minutes, hopefully, or 11. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming back after your morning tea break. Um, I hope everyone here was able to get their tea and coffee. I know things in the COVID world, catering is a whole new uh, ball game, a little bit different. Look, I um, really want to thank our speakers this morning. Jono's still here with us. Um, and I think some of our other two speakers may have left. But um, what we'd hope is that that morning of discussion was a really wonderful, thought-provoking way to begin a discussion about how we create a regenerative city or how we create a regenerative society. What I'm going to do in a minute is quickly move through the slides that I wanted to show this morning, um, but the slightly later start didn't give us a chance to. So what we'll do is in this session of our program, um, I'll give a quick introduction to the Green Prince Initiative, which is something that a number of us have been working on for a couple of years, just um, explain it as quickly as we can to show you that it's actually the scaffolding for today and parts of tomorrow. Um, but then we'll be very delighted to invite um, Rachel from Healthy Land and Water to join us and also then Kira May from um, the Bulimba Creek Catchment Group. Um, and then if time permits, we'll, we'll have um, a little bit of a discussion about the living world here in this region and our little biodiversity bingo to get us thinking. And then we'll be breaking for lunch. So if we do run a little bit later into the lunch break, um, I think we'll be able to make up time. Um, so it should all be good. So um, I'm gonna press some buttons and hope that I have better luck than the last time I pressed some buttons. Please hold. Ta-da working. Okay, so um, I'll just keep an eye on time. And many speakers connecting via text and other messages. So it's a fun juggling act. So why did we decide as a group of folks connected to Ayla, Nina and Future Dreaming um, to put our 
love of the living world surfboard onto the regenerative wave. It's because right now, a lot of the things that would have been in the 1990s called sustainability or called something else are now being labeled regenerative. And we do think that the regenerative framing is very potentially important and powerful. But of course, as I mentioned before, there are also some critical elements that if we don't do it right, it will be more of the same. So the reason we decided to kickstart a Regen Brisbane is also because in case you don't know, um, Regen Melbourne was kicked off uh, at the end of last year and they started um, a group of people looking at donut economics. And later today after lunch, um, we'll have Kai Lofgren from Small Giants talk about the work they did, kicking off some discussions amongst people about how they might apply the donut framework, which we'll talk about here today briefly. Um, to their city. Since then, there are regen movements now popping up in Adelaide, Tasmania, Sydney. I don't know about Perth or Darwin, um, but there's a couple of other regional places too using a similar label. So I didn't want Brisbane to get left behind and we created this little initiative and then the Olympic announcement came. So I guess I just wanted to say before I talk about Green Prince, our commitment as Ayla, Mina, Future Dreaming and QUT Design Lab um, is for the long term. So what we're trying to frame this as is a community think tank an opportunity to have a pathway where anyone who's got um, amazing work, great ideas or contacts of other people who they think their ideas should be brought in, this is a place to kind of hold that space for the next six, 12 months. Or as Jono said, the Olympics seem like a, ten, you know, a long way away, but there's a lot of work to be done if we actually address some of the social justice and ecological issues. Um, so what I'd like to do now, sit back, relax. I'm just gonna run you through a very, shallow version of the Green Prince approach. This ain't rocket science, we haven't invented something new. What we've done is try to make it easier for community groups we work with to really think about all the different steps that might be involved to bring, whether you wanna call it the regenerative movement or sustainability or simply living within our limits and caring for country, how we bring it all together. And because it's across a lot of different disciplines, um, yeah, I hope that some of it might be of interest to you. And certainly that's what we're going to be using as some of the background material as we build Regen Brisbane. And I'll talk more about the other regions. So the Australian Earth Laws Alliance was created um, about nine years ago by a group of lawyers. It's now multidisciplinary. It expanded beyond the legal profession very quickly. Um, but Ayla's primary goal is we're interested in seeing how we can shift from a human-centered to an earth-centered governance system. And by governance, we mean all of the rules and institutions and ways and daily practice of living and working together as human beings. So what we're interested in is shifting from the image on the left to the image on the right. And if you use um, the idea from earth jurisprudence, from deep ecology, from people like Thomas Berry, who are white fellows in the white system questioning what's been done by industrialized societies, or whether you start with Mary Graham's relationist ethos, you actually come to the same place but then the journey of once we work out, we'd like to have a thriving living world and how do we fit human beings back into that space instead of eating it all up, that journey of how we do the U-turn, uh, as Mary and others have said, that's the trick. That's the hard stuff. So that's our little logo for Green Prince. Hopefully it's self-explanatory when you see the fingerprint inside um, the living world. And it's an initiative that we created out of sheer um, uh, need because we work with a lot of community groups endlessly trying to save different parts of their ecosystems that are under threat. And every single one of those communities around Australia keeps saying, why is the legal system working for developers? Why is it so hard to stop things we don't want? Why don't we have a say over these things? And then even if we woke up tomorrow and we all agreed that we would have an ecologically healthy place, how would we even do that? Given so much of the structures we have all been born into are effectively extractivist, degenerative, and not heading in the right direction. So in simple terms, what we're interested in within the Australian Earth Laws Alliance and latching onto this regen word is regenerative human societies that thrive within explicitly understood ecological limits um, and nurture the living world. Um, this is an image that a lovely artist created to sort of indicate the beauty and flourishing of a lovely community. And these are some of the images we share. The big question, as I mentioned, is how do we get there? There are a gazillion different ideas and thoughts out there and they're all, most of them are very good and very valid. But again, from a community perspective, how do they actually start at a citizen level to understand what's going on in their place to actually thrive for something different rather than just fighting and putting out one fire at a time? How do we shift from being pro-growth pro extractivist to living within limits? And how do we do that in a socially just way? 
And my big question is how do we do that while avoiding the greenwashing that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years, particularly since the rise of the misinformation campaigns in response to climate change knowledge. I'm old enough to know what happened in the late 90s. I worked in the very first agency created in Australia to um, uh, respond to climate change, the Sustainable Energy Development Authority. We designed the excellent way to go. And within three or four years after we started doing it, bringing tons of great industries and businesses on board, the misinformation campaign began to confuse, bewilder, and then cut back uh, any of the really focused initiatives that we were seeing happen. It's been a devastating thing to watch in my lifetime. Anyone older or younger than me has probably seen the same things. We, we must be optimistic. We can, as Yin Paradis uh, said, nurture and harness these amazing things inside of us once we become uncaged. But we also have to be completely realistic about the state of the world and where we're at. And so Green Prince is not a whimsical thing. It's a, it's a matter of desperation to say, let's get some of the good stuff and just move with it. And then let's experiment and see what else we can do. So Green Prince is two things. It's a pathfinder. It offers an earth-centered process, not a human-centered process, an earth-centered way to help us find and use the best sustainability and regen approaches so that we can design, redesign human beings and human societies. Well, not human beings, it sounds like eugenics, sorry. Um, so that we can thrive within our limits. We don't wanna redesign you, we love you, really. It's also an output. By following the steps in one messy way or another, the main goal is to actually look at future scenarios. None of this is new, this stuff gets done. But what you might find is that governments rarely in this country seriously engage with scenario planning for either a landscape or a city. Because if they did and they looked at the projections coming out of business as usual, they should be terrified. But if we as community members and people with across a remarkable indigenous cultures and incredible Western disciplines can come together through these community think tank processes that we're trying to be part of and support, then we can actually map out a really livable, excellent future despite the challenges. And that's the message today. There really is a livable future and an excellent future if we could just rearrange and do that U-turn pretty quickly. So the current governance approaches that we're worried about, Green Prince aims to challenge and transform governance in Australia. That sounds very grand. We may not succeed, but hey, it's good to have a vision. And what we wanna do is actually change the rules we live by and our relationships with nature and each other at all scales of society. We wanna shift the worldview from being human-centered, patriarchal, colonial, being absolutely in love with modernity to the point we can't see outside of it and seeing nature as property. We wanna challenge the endless growth, capitalist expansion, extractivist mode. But we also as lawyers and many other scientists and disciplinary uh, folks in the system, including indigenous folks, are very aware of power. John, I mentioned this. It's not just another way to vision a better green space, it's actually saying, how do we change the very foundations of law and governance in Western, westernized Australian systems? And how do we challenge the corporatization of our political system and our communities? But it's not all about blocking the bad stuff. What we're really in love with is building the good stuff. You can't come at this work without deep joy and absolute you know, ecstasy looking at a wombat or the joys of seeing a new flower. Or as my daughter said this morning, stop looking at the flowers, you hippie, get me to school. You know, it's only love and that passion for the living world, I think that's gonna get us where we need to be. So what we're interested in is the good stuff, earth-centered, living within limits, thinking about whatever economic system we wanna label it. There's a whole bunch of wonderful ideas we can harness or throw away. Um, and in the legal stuff, exactly as Jono said, all of us chipping away at the nation states in capacity to support the uniqueness of place and the uniqueness of people. Um, but doing that in a way that chips away at the concrete and lets the flowers grow, as opposed to trying to create, um, you know, some kind of devastating overthrow, but who knows what's possible. Um, and then really analyzing, and we already got a couple of lawyers already analyzing where you can unpick some bits of existing law and reconnect it to um, better systems of localized decision-making, localized governance, but built upon a benchmark of ecological health not just handing over power to a bunch of people who will turn around themselves and get caught up in resource extraction and money. So now that's my background. I'm gonna quickly move you through the steps. There's, there's a lot of material under all this and we're already working with a bunch of different communities. Would love to chat to you more, but I just wanted to introduce this to you. Have I done something wrong? Okay, thank you. Here's my technical support. Give it up for James Lee, yay. <laughs> 
James is part of the Green Prince team and he does all of the research when I can't find stuff. He's just incredibly amazing. So I'm grateful to him. If anyone else came up to me mid-presentation, I'd probably snarl at them. But with James, it's like, what, what have I done wrong? All right, so the big question, of course, is that's all lovely. How do we get there? And we already know that a lot of communities around the world are doing amazing things. And in Australia, too, we've built the New Economy Network Australia with thousands and thousands of people because they're already doing awesome stuff. But how do we bring it all together? And that's why we're interested in making life a little easier for folks. But whatever you did, James, I can't do my slides now. Hang on. Now I can. I am clever. All right, so we are literally going, here is a stepwise way to think about the stuff we should probably do. It's not telling you what to do. It's just telling you, folks, here are some things you might want to think about if you want to build either community-based, organisational level, or go for gold and change the whole bioregional structure of governance in Australia. Um, I often refer to it as the sturdy steps through the sometimes swampy stuff of sustainability. Regenerative doesn't fit in that alliteration, but really it is just about some stepping stones because in our experience, most people find all of the things they need to do pretty confusing and murky. And so they pick one thing or another, they're not so good at putting it together. In terms of systems change uh, theories, Green Prince fits into a pretty standard way of looking at um, diagnosing an issue, planning action, and then transitioning. But in terms of an earth-centered way of doing this stuff, we start with thinking differently, and then we talk about defining boundaries just as an exercise to actually understand what's going on in the place. That might sound really simple, but I'm pausing for dramatic effect because our system doesn't do it. It never defines boundaries inside our economic, cultural or political spaces. We have all of these incredible people in natural resource management groups, land uh, management groups, land care, water catchment bodies, scientists, land care regenerators, and they're all over here. Now, the economic system is over here, not paying any attention to any of that stuff. The legal system, as a lawyer, I can tell you now, is built on the idea of continuing to support elite development, elite extractivism and growth. By its very nature, the legal system was built for that. And I can run you through the history of the English legal system, if you don't believe me. I can show you all the maps that, um, that Yin started with in terms of colonial expansion. How did we get here? My mob are Irish. We were carted over here as convicts from another place. That's colonization. So our system doesn't think about boundaries. And by that, I mean the economic and legal system. So defining boundaries is incredibly important. And even getting people to talk about ecological health and ecological limits is sometimes an act of radical behavior. And then actually understanding the place. Um, Mary Graham once told me that one of her um, Aboriginal elder mates said, white fellas always seem to be about three feet above the ground. Everything they do, it's up here. Look at all these ideas. Never put their feet in the ground, just sit under a tree and go, oh shit, that creek's a bit grubby, better sort that out. It's how do I do a brand new model? How do I develop the next big engineering solution? That lack of groundedness and that complete lack of relationship with the soil that provides our food and the trees that provide our oxygen. Where's the connection? Where do we understand? And another lovely thing Mary Graham said, I once said to her, what difference do you think it would mean if Western society understood circular time, she thought for a minute and said, well, I think it all slow down an awful lot. And that's a simple way of saying challenging the ideas of progress and modernity. Anyway, so we've got these steps and under each one is some wonderful things. And we'll run through pockets of them later today throughout all the beginning of each of our sessions. Um, I'm going over time, but that's, I'm nearly, I'm nearly done. So the other big thing after we start to understand where we live and think about it, then you've got the history. Uh, George Monbiot, one of my favourite social commentators, once said, remembering is actually a radical act. Because right now, planning and development laws are rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. What's left? Oh, let's fight over it. Not, hey, how did this place used to look? How might we redesign our entire city or our entire state or our entire bioregion to bring back what bioregions used to look like? Yes, it's subjective. Which benchmarks do we choose? Which year do we choose? I don't know. Depends on the people making the choice. But rather than just continuing to, to uh, extract everything, what does a deep restoration of place look like? And how do we make sure that human beings are happy and thriving inside of that regenerative way? There's a whole bunch of ways to check if you're an overshoot. That's a whole other thing that no one does in this country. The global ecological footprint alone is one of the best and most excellent ways of assessing impact uh, across a particular space. 
No one in government does it. If anyone's done it, there might've been inklings of it in Melbourne. That's about it. And then we come to scenarios and that's the fun stuff. And we've been developing a big fat mapping tool that makes it easy for non-mapping experts to actually understand what the heck is going on in land use and a whole bunch of other things that some folks find boring, but I find riveting, um, like life cycle analysis and thinking about, I think it was Jono was talking about where does, you know, what is the impact of our city? Where do the resources come from? Where's our food come from? Where does our waste go to? Are we just dumping everything in Ipswich? Or are we taking responsibility? All of these fascinating issues. And then community decision-making processes, which I'm passionate about, I don't have any time to talk about. Um, and then the transition action plans is where we get to experiment and play and get serious about joining up the dots of all the remarkable stuff already happening. Green prints, even its simple steps is deceptive. Of course, this stuff is messy as. Humans are messy as. We're a messy, messy species. But that we can work to that. We can use that as a strength. That's the snail of destiny. I have a different story about the snail of destiny. I don't have time for that today. You'll see the snail gets very confused here and there, it ends up upside down. But eventually you come out the other end with a different way of doing. And that is what I wanted to do in terms of introducing green prints. Um, I'm now going to, we've got a couple of other snippets of ways to remind us how to rethink governance in Australia. Um, and we do it with maps and stuff, but I might stop sharing there and Watch carefully, James, in case I mess something up again. Stop sharing. Okay, there we are. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is see if our very, very patient, wonderful guest speaker, Rachel from Healthy Land and Water, is actually on. If you are there, Rachel, could you turn your video on? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I, I did just want to... Um, dive into one of our projects. Of, actually, it's quite quite a few projects that we're delivering across um, the next couple of years and that we've delivered um, over the last couple of years. Um, so right in Brisbane here, um, just to keep it nice and local. Um, but obviously before I do, I wanted to acknowledge um, traditional owners of the country that I'm on today, which is the Jagger and the Turbal people, um, and recognise elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm very happy to uh, confirm our reconciliation action plan, um, which was confirmed about three weeks ago through Reconciliation Australia. So Healthy Lands and Water are very keenly on the path um, towards reconciliation and that's been mapped out through our plan. Um, so very exciting journey. Um, for those who don't know who Healthy Lands and Water are, we're the regional natural resource management body here in Southeast Queensland. There's 56 such bodies across Australia. Um, but we also have a very strong science arm. So we've been delivering the report cards. So through the ecosystem, through an ecosystem health monitoring program here in Southeast Queensland for the last 21 years, we're actually the first report card in Australia. So our model has been extensively studied uh, and replicated both nationally here in Australia and um, overseas. So as you would know, we now have report cards stretching all up the eastern coast um, of Australia. So in Queensland, we have the reef report cards and Healthy Land and Water still deliver our um, regional report card. And essentially that reports on um, the health and well-being, not only of our environment through um, monitoring waterway health, but also uh, looking at the health and well-being of our communities. So understanding, um, you know, what are their water literacy levels? How do they value their local environment and local waterways? What is their nature relatedness level? Um, and that sort of helps inform both Healthy Lands and Water and the partners that we work with. Um, how we could help to uh, improve, I guess, that not only environmental health, but also the health of um, the communities that rely on those environments that, that we work to manage and protect. Um, so we do a whole range of projects. I do not have time <laughs> to touch on many of them today, but I would encourage everyone to jump onto our website and have a look and certainly to reach out um, and have a chat 
if you're interested. Um, we're owned 50% by the Southeast Queensland um, Catchment Members Association. So that's representation of about 500 catchment groups from across Southeast Queensland. Um, and then we're also owned by the Council of Mayors. So represented of all local governments across Southeast Queensland and uh, also by the water utilities. So Unity Water and Queensland Urban Utilities or what is now Urban Utilities um, also have ownership of Healthy Land and Water. So I wanted to talk to you today about one of the programs that we run here at Healthy Lands and Water called Water by Design. Water by Design has been around for about 15 years. It's actually a state program. And what we do is we deliver capacity building to raise the level of practice in relation to sustainable urban water management. So we work with local governments right up and down the coast of Queensland. Um, work together with LGAQ, so Local Government Association of Queensland. The state government are a very key partner of ours through the Department of Environment and Science. And what we do is deliver outcomes around state planning policy water. So this is all about raising the skills and capacities of water practitioners to implement water sensitive urban design. So really this is about biomimicry and geoengineering. So really trying to re-establish natural systems in urban areas. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly today, um, Michelle, you're gonna to have to keep me on track here. I think I've got about six minutes. Um, on a project that we delivered using our living waterways framework. So within the Brisbane River catchment, so we know through our report card that Brisbane River, the health rating for the Brisbane River is about a C minus. Um, and we know that sediment is one of the, the major threats to the health of the Brisbane River. Um, so we're looking for opportunities to implement this living waterways framework. And what the living waterways framework is, it was co-developed with mem local government members from across Southeast Queensland and the state government. And it's an innovation pathway that sits within the state planning policy. So you can imagine that the state planning policy in terms of stormwater management objectives is very prescriptive. Um, and, and what we had found historically was that that really prescriptive approach was a significant barrier to these sort of multiple benefits that we believed were achievable through water sensitive urban design. And in fact, the research supported that very strongly and, and we see that rolled out nationally and internationally. So we wanted to establish um, some confidence around those multiple benefits. And so this living waterways framework was developed. And what it does is it allows some flexibility around the state um, stormwater management design objectives and says, look, actually what we also wanna see when you're delivering stormwater management um, best practice is outcomes for the community, outcomes for the waterways, outcomes for um, the environments that surround those waterways, recreational outcomes, acknowledging that, you know, we're not just looking for a one size fits all. So we're not looking for great infrastructure, actually. What we're trying to do is turn um, the implementation of stormwater management to replicate a more natural environment and natural system. Um, so what we did is we um, we actually were um, supported through uh, the Australian government and specifically through Trevor Evans, who is now the uh, Assistant Environment Minister, um, whose uh, electorate is Brisbane. So Trevor was very familiar with some of the sites that we had identified as a potential living waterways project. So we wanted to demonstrate, I guess, um, the applicability of living waterways. And so... Uh, we ended up landing on Davidson Street, which is in um, Newmarket and is part of Anogra Creek. I don't know why that says Davidson Creek there. Um, I do have a little video that I want to play. Is that is that possible, Michelle? So today we're celebrating the end of the Davidson Street Creek Restoration Project, but it doesn't end there, of course. We are handing over this project to the local community where they will take it forward and it will become their legacy for the future.
I think what really grabs me most about this project is the fact that it's truly engaged. It's been truly a co-design project. The school's been involved. Um, Healthy Land and Water's been involved. Councillors have been involved. The federal government has been involved, but most importantly, the local community. And it's the community that decide what needs to be done and how it can be done. Because if they don't get engaged, then there's no long-term ownership. So what we see here at Davidson and this area of Three Mile Creek, Three Mile Scrub, is the fact that the community have even got so engaged that they've actually set up their own habitat group. And that habitat group will now actually continue to care for and nourish the environment here. So it's a fantastic example how lots of people working together has a result just like this. It's just beautiful and it's fantastic. Lovely to be here today. It's very much a local and um it's just so nice to be able to um, to do something with the community. I think when we first when I first moved to this area, I was really struck by this actual park and how nice it was, how peaceful, relaxing. And so, you know, just to have things like this happening, um, you know, it's really nice. And um, I'm looking forward to being more involved with the community uh, through the um, the uh, bush care group that we've been setting up. This, this project is uh, exactly what we want to see. This is what it's all about. Uh, I am so, so passionate about projects like this one, Ben. I think that's why it's so exciting to have the next generation of locals, the kids at St. Ambrose here and a part of this project and projects like it. As educators, we're always looking for ways to engage the children in learning. But neither Melinda nor I could have predicted how enthralled and captivated the children would become throughout this project. It ignited their passion for learning and their genuine interest in discovering an area which is very relevant to them. From the moment we explained to the class what was required of them and how they could be involved, the children's enthusiasm and sustained energy for the project has been truly inspiring. It's been really cool. Um, we're holding working bees about once a month, so um, welcome to come along. Um, We'll try in the park, maybe just drop in and say hello to us and, and find out what we're doing. So um, just really quickly, I'm going to wrap up because I know that um, uh, I'm pretty much out of time. But um, what's significant about this project is that the business as usual approach for delivery of waterway restoration projects is to go into a community and tell them or deliver them a pre-approved plan or master plan and to sort of get their feedback about it and, you know, allow community to have a voice. I'm saying that in inverted commas. Um, the process that we deliver through Living Waterways, we go to the community with a completely blank slate and get them to design what they want in terms of the investment that's being delivered in their community. It's in recognition that the community hold the legacy for those investment opportunities and that the community are the expert citizens of that place. So it brings everything back to a place-based system and everything that falls out, if you start from there, everything that falls out from that achieves those multiple outcomes that we're seeking, which is environmental, social, amenity and you know, human centric, it's about ensuring that our spirits are healthy as well. Um, and that's really what I wanted to share with you today. Um, thanks so much for your time. I didn't get to jump into everything, um, but please get in contact if you do have any questions and uh, are interested in a project in your area. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thanks for your patience as our sound disappeared and came back. Did you want to just, if you click on your photo, oh, it's gone, it's okay. I was going to say, if you want to type your contact details into the chat, um, we can include them certainly for those online and we can share them with others here as well. Um, but thank you again, Rachel, and certainly we're planning a whole range of other events over the coming 12 to 24 months. 
um, and Susie Chapman and I had already started some green prints work together last year for the sunny coast before COVID. So I'm sure we will see lots more of um, the wonderful Healthy Land and Waters gang very soon. So thank you for your time, Rachel. Can everyone say thank you? Thanks so much. Uh, everyone's so patient with us today with our technical hiccups. I'd now like to introduce Kira um, to talk probably fairly briefly and we're a slightly different height. So why don't I get out of the way and um, we'll put the camera down for you, my darling. Maybe I shouldn't touch anything. It Are might explode. Slides? No, no slides. Oh, well, okay. maybe just give her the mic and people yep. can hear her. Oh, no, there you are. See, we're not heightest. We're not. <laughs> um, I'd just like to introduce Kira. I invited Kira to speak today because she's been doing, she and her other community members in the Belimba Creek catchment area really are the heart and soul of the local people caring about their rivers now and the creeks. So um, I guess if you want to make sure that folks don't trample over you to get to lunch, maybe six minutes would be good. Yeah, a little bit shorter, but still awesome. Yeah. Thank sure. you so much. Hi everyone, my name's Kira and I'm from Bulimba Creek Catchment Coordinating Committee, which is a handful to say. So um, people usually call us B4C. Um, so B4C is one of 11 catchment groups um, in Brisbane. Um, and our catchment group is one of the biggest. It um, it, it's a, a big area that, um, that encompasses the Bulimba Creek Waterway, which goes from roughly around Carina to Runcorn. Um, that's just a rough area. Um, B4C is a community-based social enterprise that provides coordination, support, and specialised ecological services that protect, restore, and maintain the Bulimba Creek catchment. Um, and we do it in partnership with members of the catchment and the wider community. Um, and there's other catchment groups across Brisbane that do similar things um, for their own catchment areas, but they don't all do the same things, different things. So there's a network body called the Brisbane Catchment Network where um, representatives of each catchment across Brisbane come together under the one umbrella um, where it's possible to provide a unified voice to authorities to discuss strategic direction and also to collaborate with other organisations to protect and restore our creeks and also the Brisbane River. Sorry, this is the first time I've ever spoken in front of people, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so there are a lot of different things that the catchment groups do to fulfil their stewardship of the land, but one of the things I think is most important to talk about in regards to this workshop is Brisbane's unique hold on its biodiversity through the natural areas and corridors which I think is really a big part of the scaffolding that Michelle was talking about earlier. So Brisbane has luckily retained a lot of its natural areas, which mostly comprises of the wetlands, corridors and nature reserves. So whether it be good planning or good luck, this has allowed biodiversity to flourish in many of the urban areas. And the main factor for Brisbane still having a rich biodiverse ecosystem is that the core habitat living in the nature reserves and large um, natural areas have enabled a greater diversity of species to survive. So that has been one really important part. And the other really important part um, are the nature, the natural corridors, which um, the biodiversity and its genetics can move and interact. So if you haven't heard of natural corridors, they are natural pathways that connect two natural areas um, separated by human activities or structures. Um, so um, there are various kinds of corridors, but the ones specific to Brisbane are the waterways, which Rachel was speaking of before, and also um, the wildlife corridors. So a waterway corridor is defined as an area along waterways, so including rivers and creeks, and it's desi designed to protect water flow, water quality and biodiversity. And wildlife corridors um, are areas of habitat, habitat connecting wildlife populations and allowing them to move freely through the urban areas. So basically, if you're looking at the urban diverse, um, biodiverse, biodiversity in human anatomical way, you could look at it like the nature reserves and the natural areas are the organs of the system and then the corridors um, are the arteries or veins which keep everything alive and moving. In Brisbane, the role of 
the corridors has been the key. Without connectivity between our natural areas and reserves, the future of our wildlife and biodiversity would not be sustainable. So the reason the, 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 that Brisbane's natural ecosystems are working so well is just not um, because of good planning or good luck. It has had community advocates fighting for it for over years. And it's another vital component to protecting Brisbane's natural ecosystems, just as the corridors are. These advocates are usually either the catchments themselves, indigenous communities, bush care groups, land for wildlife participants as well, and many others. So some examples of community actions to protect the natural areas and corridors are by pushing back to the authorities on development proposals that may cut off a corridor link. This could be done by developing and implementing campaigns to raise awareness and encourage members of the community to voice their concerns um, to local government authorities. And B4C and other catchment groups also put together complex submissions full of research and evidence-based information to oppose developments. And also we talk to councillors and members of parliament about um, the issues to see if that can advocate on our behalf. That sometimes works. Um, they also do proposals for st strategic bushland acquisitions to ensure other uses don't compromise the corridors. Um, and then the bush care groups and land for wildlife um, participants physically um, involve themselves in rehabilitation, um, especially for uh, the waterway corridors, as well as protecting our nature reserves. Um, and finally, B4C works with groups um, and organisations to help increase wildlife survival on their way to other natural areas. Um, and they do this by creating overpasses and underpasses and other form, fauna movement solutions, such as fauna furniture and culverts, rope ladders, um, refuge poles and fauna fencing. Am I right? Yes, that's awesome. Okay, cool. I've just got a little oh, bit yeah, more. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, so just to give you an example of this, um, B4C led a project at Salvin Creek, which is the link between Whites Hill Reserve and Bulimba Creek. And it's a really good example of community action and advocacy. Um, so that before the project started in the mid nineties, um, like many of the waterways, it was highly degraded, unfunded, the weeds were dominating and developers were on the charge. Um, now in the area, um, there has been six acquisitions and a dedication of 6.5 hectares um, of reserve in Carindale by the state government and land along the creek taken into public ownership by the council. Do I have enough time or? We might have to end it there or people will starve. Okay, cool. All but... right. I just wanted to just end on saying that um, that kind of work is, um, is actually really important um, for the community. Um, because um, it continues um, the um, it continues to grow community support as well. Like when we're doing all these um, projects, people get involved and people start to hear about it, and it people come become more aware of what's going on in Brisbane. So I had a little bit more to go, but yeah, that'll, I'll end it there. That is brilliant. Let's give it up for Kira. Huh? <laughs> Thank you so much, Kira. And I have to ask, what is fauna furniture? I know what the rest of it was. What's fauna furniture? It's uh, like um, helping people, um, helping animals get um, the one like that um, helps violence get um, because they don't like um, to um, like the animals get their feet. Yeah, so, little stepping stones and things. I, I imagine them in a little armchair, but I guess they don't need that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And look, I'm sure even with this whirlwind tour to lunch, we've heard about big picture thinking, the relationist ethos, how to decolonize our minds, um, a bit about the Green Prince approach itself. It's trying to weave it all together. And then Rachel is an example of some of the amazing people truly doing some of the best work in Australia through NRM and catchment management bodies. And then Kira, and I didn't actually realize it was your very first time but you're so awesome. Um, just a beautiful talk about the fact that people are engaging and doing and caring for places. And without that day-to-day, -day, as Mary Graham would call it, ethics is a doing thing, without that day-to-day -day ethic and action, um, our creeks would be in a much worse position. 
what we're going to do now is break for lunch. You're still going to get your half an hour because I do love a good break. And then when we come back, um, we're going to weave in and out some of the other bits and pieces. I promise we'll still play biodiversity bingo. It's the first thing we're going to do when you come back from lunch because hopefully you'll have a little sandwich and feel good. So let's take a break, everyone. Um, I think quarter past one, but let's just eat quickly and come back in and we'll get going. So thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, we'll talk in a minute about how we can define boundaries for Brisbane and then a little bit of a, a little scratching across the surface of getting to know our ecological foundations. And then I'll be very pleased in a moment um, to hand over um, to, to Delwyn Jones from the EVA Institute to give us literally a 10 minute introduction to the complexity of the world of looking at human impacts through a couple of different lenses. And I won't preempt what she was, is going to say. And I'm really grateful to Delwyn for joining us tomorrow and leading us in a workshop that actually looks at what is Brisbane doing? What is Brisbane using? How do we calculate that? How do we think about that? And again, not to jump from here I am going, let's love nature and now let's calculate it. It's how do we know what our buildings are made of? Uh, how do we know what our roads are made of? Where is this stuff coming from? Where are things going to? Because as I said before, you can't just think about regenerative stuff. It's a nice thing to do, but we have to put the proverbial rubber to the road or the hemp made structure of thing to the road. So yeah, so that's the introduction to this session. And now our goal is to move along and at 1.40, the fabulous Professor Will Steffen, one of the co-authors of the original work on planetary boundaries will be joining us to talk about not, so we've started with a session on locating ourselves within our place. We're gonna, we're gonna dabble in the bioregion, float down the catchment, um, but then we're gonna go out into outer space and look back at planet Earth. Um, because planetary boundaries is a really important place for outer boundaries for the whole planet. And one of the new things people are doing in sustainability or regen is downscaling from planetary boundaries and upscaling local activities to see how we can contribute in a positive way to the bigger picture of the Earth system. And then it's planetary boundaries was the inspiration for Kate Raworth to look at donut economics. We're going to have a yarn about the economic system, just enough to whet your appetite, not enough to put you to sleep. Um, so I wanted to just quickly mention boundaries. Um, so bioregions, what are bioregions? Um, this is one definition from the New South Wales government website. They talk about bioregions as capturing the large scale geophysical patterns across Australia. These patterns in the landscapes are linked to animal and plant groupings and processes at the ecosystem scale and provide a useful way of reporting on more complex patterns of biodiversity. Um, they've actually changed their definition. This is far less pleasing than the old one. Another definition of bioregions is nature's way of telling you about herself from the geology up. Bioregions are essentially geological, then soil, then plant types, telling you where places are different from each other. And what's really excellent in Australia is that um, over the last however many years, we've actually done workshops on the history of the bioregional um, and interim um, regionalization process. We've got a lot more info if you want it. But over the many years, um, we've gotten to this point here where we've got what they call version seven. And you can see that they've, they've identified 89 bioregions. There's about 415 sub regions. And if you want to go a bit smaller than that, you can see catchments fitting across and within sub, uh, sub regions and, and regions. We're not going to harp on too much about the science today. What we wanted to do was remind us all that if you take away the political boundaries of Australia, and if you're a non-Indigenous person who wants to engage with um, the Indigenous map of Australia, that's a wonderful way to start with relationships. But if you don't have friends or family or recent connections to Indigenous communities, and you don't want to be seen to culturally appropriate their cultural boundaries, this is a really nice way to start looking at the continent from a very different point of view. And if I have time later today, I'm going to give you my six slide overview of how maps can help us think differently about the work ahead of us. But just for now, if you've never seen this map before, um, if you want to look up bioregions, I love it because I think it's a beautiful way to look across the continent. And when you look at this map and the subregions and then look at the Aboriginal map of Australia, you're seeing some remarkable similarities, which we can talk about tomorrow a bit more. Well, what I wanted to do was zoom in on the pink. I forgot my arrow there, but you see the little, the long pink strip? That has been classified as uh, a bioregion with its own unique qualities and Brisbane is part of it. Whereas other bioregions have fun names, ours is kind of boring. It's called Southeast Queensland, which is a bit, you know, it could have been something more, more amazing. But what's really interesting is that you'll see that bioregions ignore political boundaries. And even though it's called 
the southeast Queensland bioregion cuts down into the northern parts of New South Wales. Why does this matter? If you could imagine that we did a mapping process where we looked across each of the 80 known bioregions and actually did an analysis of human activity, historical, current and future, and thought about scenarios for each place, imagine if we got each of those 89 bioregions about right, then the entire continent would be in better shape. It's a very simplistic thinking tool, but the chaos that often happens when we think about sustainability, at what scale, what can we do? The bioregional map can bring a little bit of peace because if we literally analyzed each one, whether you're a city, whether you're a region, and don't think it's just cities causing harm. Where I grew up, the Brigalow Belt bioregion, um, something like 90% of its original vegetation is gone. We've decimated that bioregion for agriculture and uh, grazing. So any of our bioregions on this continent, if we were able to look across them all and think about what's happening, how do we do it differently? How do we make sure that what's going on within that boundary makes sense, is sustainable or regenerative? then we would actually have a way of saying, are we there yet? You know, that endlessness feeling that some of us get when we're trying to make sure that the systems are getting better. Anyway, it's really about the thinking exercise, but also uh, on the Green Prince website, which will be up in a couple of weeks, there's also going to be a, the lovely story of every bioregion, why it is unique, why it is different, what it means. Okay, so again, uh, that's just... Um, that's a great map that James took off our um, map, one of our mapping tools, and you can actually see how Brisbane sits right in the heartland of, of the whole bioregion. But catchments are actually another mechanism that people use to do um, water quality assessment, to do community building around natural resource management, um, and a whole bunch of other ways of managing water for public utilities. Catchments are a very, very dominant way of seeing the world and analyzing the world in the Western mindset. Um, and I just wanted to remind people what catchments are, because if you're going to connect with Regen Brisbane or whatever we get up to together, um, people will talk about the catchment a lot. Um, so the catchment is simply an area um, where water is collected in the natural landscape. The outside edge of a catchment is always the highest point and gravity causes all rain and runoff in the catchment to run downhill where it naturally collects into the creeks, rivers, lakes or oceans. Rain falling outside the edge of one catchment is actually falling in a different catchment. So if you're like me and you're not a scientist and you never knew what a catchment really was, it's pretty handy to know. And you can actually do a map of all of Australia showing all of the catchments, mostly sort of. Some water also seeps below ground where it's stored in the soil or in the space between rocks. This is called groundwater. And as you know, all of our water systems in Australia are ancient, precious and under threat. Um, so catchments are a very precious way to actually look at the landscape and understand what we're doing. And even from what we heard with healthy land and water and the Balimba Creek catchment, focusing on waterways is also a really good way for human beings to focus on an area. So I don't believe in any one way forward. I'm a pluralist, I think. I like bioregions as a way to tell the story from the geology up. I like catchments because that's where a lot of the data is. It doesn't really matter. If we're trying to get serious about setting boundaries, we just experiment with a couple and try to see where the data is. Because once you start to play with maps and info on scientific data in this country, you will just be drowning in it. That's why James and I have been um, kind of struggling with a mapping tool for a couple of years, trying to get something that's really easy for people to just bring in what's going on in this place and what is this place and tell different stories about it. And there's already a lot of stuff out there. Oh, this I just found was a really cool map. Someone's handwritten, if the rain falls here, it belongs to that catchment, it belongs there. So you can see that the Northeast coast, we're sort of part of that. When rain hits the ground, it kind of comes out to the ocean. But you can see a bit further west, any of the rain that comes in, is starting to uh, affect the, the massive Murray-Darling Basin or going over to Lake Eyre. And Australia's ancient geological history will tell you why um, so much water flows into a, a funny old lake in the middle of the salt. But there's some pretty cool things we can know just to be aware of. Catchments are one of our boundaries we can think about. I came back to that for a reason, but I can't remember, so I'll keep moving. All right, biodiversity. Finally, we get to talk about the plants and the animals, yay. Um, I'm sure we all know as Queenslanders um, the, the horrible things that are happening to our beautiful, beautiful reef um, and the fact that recently the federal government yet again succeeded in manipulating the World Heritage Gang into not declaring the reef as deeply, deeply, deeply threatened and in trouble. Um, so there's so many issues we obviously need to think about. But what I wanted to show you was a terrific map James dug up. This is vegetation, so our plant friends, our plant communities, pre 
European colonization. So you can see the Brisbane River curling through there like a glorious snake. You can see the purple zones that are mangroves and salt marshes and all the soggy places. I'm a mangrove girl now, grew up in the desert, live in mangroves, love it. Soggy, insect fueled, full of little creatures and crabs, love it. But have a little look at what happened since then. That is a powerful map. I think that's a good place to start thinking about regenerative cities, don't you? What have we lost? What have we gained? What's worth putting back? What's worth knocking down? I love the story Jono told us about how, and it's such a trend at the moment, people are actually pulling up the concrete that's been poured over creeks and letting those systems come back to life for so many complex reasons. It's all, it's all good. But yeah, just looking at that map, this is what uh, Mianjin, the Aboriginal peoples, the Yaga Aturabu peoples lived in, an absolute abundance of biodiversity or plant and animal communities, friends, food, resources, medicine, bush tucker. And that's, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. So biodiversity bingo. This is um, finally we got to it. It's really not all that exciting. I hate it when you beat something up so much and people go, oh my God, that wasn't very exciting. Um, but I'm also going to combine it with an effort to get you moving after our, um, our lunch break. So if you'd all like to just stand up and if you're at home, feel free to stand up or just ignore me because you can, these fellas can't. And of course you do not have to participate. You don't have to do anything. All right, so sometimes we use paper, but we're trying to go paper free. So to biodiversity bingo, we're just gonna say, who lives here with us? And we're just gonna see how many people, and we're not gonna punish you. We're just gonna be standing up and down. And I know it's annoying, but it's only about eight or nine. It's to get you moving. Who lives here with us? If you think wombats live with us, please sit down. Oh, no. <laughs> the only problem with this, it's so physical, people go, no, no, no one else is sitting down. You're correct, the northern hairy nose wombat does not live in Brisbane. Has it ever lived in Brisbane? Not as far as we know, but then what do we know? Anyway, thank you, well done, that's your first. Do eastern grey kangaroos live with us here in Brisbane? Sit down if you think they do. I see some folks are not sitting down in a hurry. The people sitting down are correct. Of course they do. They are all over the place. They pop in and out of different reserves and parks. Everyone stand up again. This is about exercise. You don't get off the hook now. All right. Does anyone know this bird, a regent honey eater? Does anyone think this one doesn't live with us? Sit down if it doesn't live in Brisbane. Ooh, there's a lot of, ooh. I've never heard that sound in a, in a workshop before. Ooh. It does actually live here. There you go. Jump back up, everyone. See, you're getting your exercise. Does anyone think this little froggy lives in Brisbane right now? Uh, sit down if you think it lives here right now. Little froggy, southern day frog. Toda calacadacus jairus. Little froggy does not live here anymore, but it used to. It went extinct in 1979. Poor little froggy. Not cool, huh? Has anyone even heard of that frog before? You have. A human over there has heard of that frog. Awesome. You win biodiversity bingo because it has no classification for winning, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, Spangled drongo. Everyone stand up again. Yes, yes. Would you like to sit down if this little dude does not live here? Either everyone's happy to stay. Oh, we've got a few sitting down. Bum, bum. We do live amongst the drongos. Hooray. Spangled drongos do live in Brisbane. And there's the occasional human who's a drongo as well, I'm sure. What about, everyone stand up again, unless you're sick of it, you're very welcome to sit. Um, what about the red-necked paddy melon, does it live in Brisbane? Sit down if it doesn't. <laughs> well, I was told that it does live in Brisbane. So the little paddy melon turtles about probably these days on the edges. I don't know if people like Kira have seen them, but paddy melons live here. You'd be surprised what lives amongst us. Thank you. Only a couple more. Okay, everybody stand up. We've only got two more, I think. Does the red-eared slider turtle live here in Brisbane with us? Okay, you can sit down if it doesn't. Yes. Now, while you're doing that, even if it did live in Brisbane, is it native? Does it come from here? No, it doesn't. 
You're correct. It does live here, but it's imported. It's a feral, just like me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we've only got one more. I know it's chaotic, darlings. It was so much easier when we used to use paper. Blue banded bee. Does it live in Brisbane? Hands up if it lives in Brisbane. Hands on your hands here if you like. <laughs> I'm being stupid. When I'm with the kids, I make them do their little, their little antenna. But yes, blue banded bees are glorious. I have adopted them as a semi totem for myself. And if you've never seen one in Brisbane, then you're missing out. They are the most divine little magical creatures. Can anyone think of any other animals that they've seen in Brisbane that they were utterly surprised to see here? Other than an honest politician. Oh. <laughs> Echidnas? You've seen one? Fantastic. Little dudes should be here. Mysterious little, little tractors of the bush. Any other animals that you've seen here that you were surprised? Uh, did you know that we've got at least three different kinds of gliders? The squirrel, the sugar, the feather tail. I think the feather tail lives here. Maybe I've got that one wrong. Multiple versions of po possum versions. Which one, Dale? The greater glider lives down here? I I did not know that. I thought he was a little dude down south or up north. So that is the end of biodiversity bingo. In a long workshop, we do it in much more detail and a much more sensible and satisfying way. But what I wanted to do really was get you moving and get you thinking about the creatures we live here with. Now I am quite over time, but um, where's Delwyn? There you are. Delwyn, I'm just, um, I'm just gonna stop sharing and see if Will Stefan is with us. There he is. Hi, Will. Delwyn, I might get you to jump on um, with me shortly after Will Stefan. Is that okay? Yes, we can do that. So I'm just going to make Will, I'm making you able to share screen. Ah, oh, good. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, Will. We have had an eclectic and hectic day talking about a whole range of issues for the Brisbane bioregion and the Brisbane area. Um, and so we're very pleased to have you join us now. What I'll do is introduce you um, and then let you take over for screen. But for folks who are not aware of um, Will Stephan's work, Will is a professor at um, the Stockholm Institute and also um, was, or I think is still at ANU and is also one of our revered climate counselors. Um, and I have been an admirer of Will's work for many, many years. He's one of the co-creators and co-authors of one of the most important concepts that we've been able to develop in Western science, I think, uh, planetary boundaries. I've invited Will to talk with us today about the big picture. We're thinking about how we create regenerative societies and in particular in our little pocket, our bioregion and our catchment, because we all know what they are now. Um, but how do we as good global citizens and good earthlings fit what we do and connect it up to the bigger picture problems we know we're facing, climate change, um, as well as the global biodiversity uh, problems and many more things. So, now, Delwyn is going to speak with us. She was meant to come straight after me, where we were talking about. Um, you know, trying to understand what boundaries we could set to then draw a picture inside that and go, what are we actually doing here? How do we understand our impacts? So what Delwyn can talk about very briefly, but we're going to explore much more in the workshop tomorrow, um, is the big picture of life cycle analysis and other things. Now, James, would you mind helping Delwyn find the presentation? Because I think my brain is dead. <laughs> it's a classic example of curved time. Is that because I'm going to refer to Will's work. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't particularly like being under the microscope with Will at the helm in case I get it wrong. Okay, so this is about tomorrow and the workshop that we're going to do on bioregional development. Can you not hear me? No, there's only one of us. Okay. Oh, there's one there. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so the the planet's facing the sixth, sixth extinction, mostly because of urban development, us, and climate change. There's a lot of argument about all the other causes, but NGOs, such as a lot of people here belong to, um, have been pleading 
with ISO and the UN about the field that I work in, which is one of the main fields of assessing environmental damage. And they're saying, hey guys, you're not using sufficient metrics. They don't address the time factor. They don't address forestry. They don't address a lot of things. So the NGOs understand a lot better about the fields that I work in than many of the people who work in the field. That said, it's a new field. It's only been around 25, 30 years. And these maps here, um, the red area down the bottom is an indicator of the areas which are beyond outside the planetary boundaries, their biodiversity loss. And this is some of, this is from World's work. And below that in the yellow map is an electricity use per person. And that's one of the indicators that we look at in life cycle analysis because we have this reliance on fossil fuels. And fossil fuels and electricity are in, why is this moving forward? Are incredibly inefficient, which is why we have the problem with them. Fossil fuels used as feedstocks in plastics are not the problem that they are if you burn them in an inherently 90% often inefficient system. So it's us using really bad systems and us using a lot of them that's part of the problem. Oops. Okay, this is some work we did with some master's students from CML where some Australians were supervising them. You're in charge, you know that, don't you? No, I'm just, just, just okay. fine. And at CML, that's the university that is attributed with developing a lot of the methods that we use in life cycle assessment. Okay, so we, we petitioned them and I work with a CML graduate, she's an ever associate and she's in Spain at the moment. And we commissioned them to look at the benefit analysis for regeneration. Was it possible? What were the pitfalls? Who was doing it? And they came up with this, this map of how you could look at damage assessment as well as benefit assessment within the same field. So this covers regeneration and allows you to speak not just to loss and damage, but I mean, it's terrifying. No wonder people greenwash it. It's all this horrible bad news about every time we turn around, we're doing something even worse than we imagined we were doing. We aren't in my field anyway looking at benefit and assessment routinely because we haven't even thought about it. I have these arguments with people in life cycle analysis. They think it is not possible. They think in a technical sphere, it is not possible to have systematic benefits. They're not biologists. Okay, so this is uh, from the uh, natural step. And this is defin as a definition of a funnel between capacity and demand where development has blocked itself. The, the, the capacity and the demand, the de capacity is diminishing, the demand is too great. We don't have the resources, we're fouling our own nests. And they say by 2050, pretty gloomy. And they suggest that there are four steps, and this is out of Northern European, you have to become renewable, you have to become biodynamic, you have to become regenerative and synergistic. And here you see on the sides, four little planets. There's a business as usual, which is the assumption that we have a spare planet. So we're sending rockets off to find other planets. And then there's the tighten your belt, turn off the switch, it's the austerity idea. And then there's these two green and blue ideas, which encapsulate, encapsulates the kind of thinking um, sets of ideas for regenerative development. So this is the references where Will's work and mine over overlap. So the little blue dot on the big gray ball is all the water, marine and fresh water on the planet. You're supposed to say, oh, it's not a lot. And the pink ball, little pink ball on the big blue ball next to it is all the air on the planet, all of it. And the apple 
and the apple is there with the pink and blue dot to show the yellow sphere, which is hot magna, which we can't live in. So the red skin of the apple is what we have. That's, that's the land beneath our feet, not a lot. And then the big gray ball, which the, with the red system boundary around it, is a really, really, really heavy ball of planet that we call Earth, that's home planet. So there's an awful lot of it that we can't use. And the bits that we're using, we're fouling and we're running out of because we don't have the budgets. People don't do their budgets until Will and his cronies came along. Down the bottom of that, we've got another set of rings, which most ecologists can recognize. And these are the boundaries around the various wilderness systems, urban technosphere and industrial um, technosphere. Now, the really, really, really sad thing is the urban biophilic technosphere is the last opportunity to save a lot of the creatures of wilderness. That's where we can save our bees and our frogs. So the work that the people this morning have been talking about is so vital because we're losing our wilderness and the wilderness or the wildness that's remnant in our, in our bioregions and our cities is a refugia. So this is a very, very important place and you're all very, very important people for working on saving the creatures that we live with, that we depend on. I think I'm speaking to the wrong set of slides. There's only 12 in this set. Maybe it's my wrong number. Okay, we have a set of global challenges. We have a set of global solutions, but you're not going to find the solutions in the bucket called damages. And that's where the IPCC and life cycle analysts have been looking at. We studied dam damages. Okay, because there were a lot of damages. So when you, in my field, you look at the best future life cycle analysis at the moment can predict is zero damages. No recovery, no regeneration, because we don't have the reach into benefits beyond zero damages. We don't have the language, the communications and the metrics until the Ever Institute with Global Green Tag invented it. Because Global Green Tag um, is led by a teacher who's going to talk to you this afternoon, and an architect. An architecture speaks the language of regeneration. Science doesn't. The trouble with the language of regeneration is it doesn't speak dollars because it doesn't have metrics that are, um, what's the word? Incompressible metrics. So the, the bean counters can say that many dollars will give me that, that much outcome. It's easy to speak about koalas and, and green feeling. So it's very important to have the metrics of positive benefits and we're developing them. So we have a frog stick here, which I'd like you to use and I can send our leader a copy of it. And it also comes from an eco polis developer out of Adelaide. And on the one side, far side, where, where we're at at the moment, destroys pure water, destroys pure air, all those bad things. The frog stick likes, the creates pure air, creates pure water, stores rainfall. Those are really good touchstones for you to think about in, in your planning. And um, it's easy to also measure them. I've put down here the Southeast Queensland land zones. There are about 11 of them. And if you go on Google, you'll be able to find all the in danger and endangered and safe species in the, each of those regions. So if you recognize those landfalls, you'll be able to go and adopt a tree or whatever it is you want to adopt because it's all been mapped. Very, very rich. So you, you're not going to be short of data. This Ganya Banganya is from a 1997 conference where we had the Brisbane Indigenous Media Association do all the audio. And um, this is from a, a very famous Murray mob family, the Bales family, Eric and Tiger, I worked with him, them, 
And it was such an absolute honor, an absolute honor to work with them. They were absolutely amazing people. So the message stick is a visa which guarantees safe passage across a particular land, but it has a set of obligations with that visa and that predated Invasion Day and colonization. You can see here Auntie Mary's U-turn. That's why I was so excited. So the red line goes from all the damages we can measure and the impact assessment stops at zero. And that's where you start counting benefit assessment because before that, the benefits only make up for the damages. You have to have more benefits than damages to actually have net positive. There's another way of looking at it. So, the, um, the work of life cycle impact assessment is about decreasing the bad stuff. And the life cycle benefit assessment is about increasing the good stuff. Where Will comes in is we use planetary boundaries as the endpoints or the benchmarks with which to measure the capacity, the endpoint, if you like, of the benefit assessment. Sometimes people will want to go further, but at least in regeneration, if you can approach that capacity, you're probably doing quite well. And my little friendly frog is perched in the middle. So again, counts on damage and counts on benefit. It's not just the negative metrics, it's the whole language. If you have a whole globe, small planet, suffering greenwash, because you can, the science can only give you bad news, you start to feel really sympathetic to the greenwashers. So we need a new language of persuasion, of hope and inspiration, so they can shout the gains that they've made while also declaring the damages that they've caused. So they can get a black and white set of accounts and industry can truly partner with us. So this, this shows a city suburb report, a positive, develop, positive development. Anyone can do it. You look at the pre-settlement condition, where we are now and where you want to be, and you map those things. And you can use a whole set of metrics. We did it for the Victorian government and the, the headmasters loved it. You can do it with any school. You can do it just on percentile improvements. Am I out of time? Yes. Almost. Okay, so another boundary I've drawn here, your purple city. We look at air, land and water. The little icon down the bottom is the material flows in life cycle analysis. We look at air, land, water and life. So the Ever Institute is custodian of five national databases that have crossed the federal, state, and uh, local governments and industry tens of millions of dollars. But this wicked little woman made sure that she had copies of them in her larder, and we put them all together, and we have issued one as freeware that any of you and your students would be able to use um, on um, OpenLCA software, which is also freeware. So there's a free database and a free freeware, which talks about concrete and steel and everything you need to build a city. So this is from the Rocky Mountain Institute, this drawing, and it confirms what we already know, that you turn, or you used to turn an incandescent light bulb on, and it was about 0.1% fuel efficient. I think if you turn an LED on, it's about 2% fuel efficient because of the losses. You know, that's where all the carbon's gone. Not delivering us electricity, but not delivering us electricity. It goes as heat and losses in the system. Nobody would buy shares in it if you were trying to sell it now. Build a power station, no, thank you very much. I'll have a wind turbine and kill birds instead. Okay, so this is an idea of um, a, steel, a steel mill and the various production systems that we map in our, um, in our database. So it has all these operations, 
for about 14 countries. We have um, over, I think it's 80 forests in our databases of various, various different kinds. We have every copper mine in Queensland, uh, um, every aluminium smelter. Okay, I'm going. I think it's finished. I think it's finished. When you get down to the nitty gritty of it, that's a floor covering. World's best practice floor covering. That's a floor covering. That's, that's a profound moment to end it on. So, Delvin, thank you for that. Thank you, Delvin. Thank you, Delvin. Thank you for that remarkably quick skating across deep complexity. And as I said earlier, the processes that we're interested in don't start there. These are not the critical points of caring for country or thinking about how we live in a place forever. But these mechanisms that have been worked on so hard um, and developed and improved are one piece of the overall green print story of what are we doing in a place and how do we do it differently? Um, and so some of those systems are of deep interest to many of us who are looking across the board at the kinds of change we want to see. And now, if Gaia is on our side, we will hear from Will Steffen. I'm going to take my spotlight off. I'm going to spotlight him. Will, uh, you're on mute at the moment. Would you like to speak to us and say hello? Okay, I think I'm off mute now. Hopefully you can hear me. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Now, Marcus is working on making sure... Um, so, Will, can you see your slides on our system? Yeah, I could a minute ago. So thanks, Marcus. You, you had them up. Um, I must, I don't know, do I need to share a screen again? I'm not sure. I, no, you don't need to share a screen, but I think um, Yeah, because I'm afraid to do anything. Here we go. Yes, there they are. I Thank can see you. them up here. Right. Um, so. Over to you, Will Stefan. Thank you so much for your patience. We're sorry that... Um, well, I'm the, one who should, I'm the one who should be apologizing. I'm not sure what's gone wrong with my system, but uh, the last couple of times I've tried to give a talk, I couldn't get um, screen share to work properly. So thanks very much for doing it this way. So I'll just say next, yeah, so, so that's just the uh, opening slide, the title. So I'll talk about planetary boundaries. Next slide, please. Right, so what's the rationale? Well, it is that the Holocene is the only state of the Earth system, I'll tell you what the Holocene is in a moment, that we know can support our complex human civilizations. So it's keeping Earth inhabitable for humans, basically. Um, and the problem is our activities are now so pervasive and disruptive that they aren't only disrupting local and regional ecosystems, they're actually disrupting the entire planetary system and shoving it away from the Holocene. So the boundaries are a scientifically based framework for defining what a Holocene-like state of the Earth system is and how far away we are from it and in which direction we're moving it. So next slide, please. So the, the basic premise is our planet is a single system. We're obviously used to talking about ecosystems and all sorts of systems at local and regional level, which of course are there. But when you actually look at this, this planet from space and study it as a, a planetary system, it's, it behaves just like a, a well-functioning a well system in its own right. Um, and of course, we humans are changing that. But this is the basis on which we develop planetary boundaries. Next slide, please. So our reference point here is a thing called the Holocene, which I've mentioned. It's a geological epoch. Uh, it's the most recent one, uh, but I think it's going to have a quick ending as uh, geologists are considering formalizing the Anthropocene. But basically, if you look at the last 12,000 years or so, this uh, horizontal axis is in thousands of years, that's 100,000 years, uh, and the wiggly line is global temperature. So you see that over the last 12,000 years, temperature has been relatively stable compared to the ice age before it. Obviously, there is variability, you see wiggles there, but it's pretty tightly constrained, plus or minus one degree. Uh, and that's the um, climate that's allowed us to develop civilization, agriculture, all the sort of things that we are uh, used to today. Next slide. Yeah, so that's just the Holocene. Next one. Yes, this is what's happening to the Holocene. This is global average temperature from 1850 to 2020. 
Uh, so you can see that it's been rising very, very steadily since uh, the mid 20th century, but particularly since around 1970 or so. Okay, hit the next one, please. Yeah, so 2020 this past year was 1.2 degrees C above the 1850-1900 average, uh, which is called pre-industrial. It was one of the three hottest years that we've ever recorded since we've had measurements from about 1850. Next one. So this is a pretty striking one. Uh, this is 2000 years of temperature now, and it's what we call the late Holocene baseline. Those colored lines are the averages of the, um, uh, of the temperatures year by year. And you can see it's been extremely steady, only a change of about a 10th of a degree or so. Uh, over the last 2000 years. And that's really what's allowed humans to flourish. We have an extremely reliable, steady climate. But notice on the far right, there's a, there's a very sharp, big black spike. That's not a model projection. That's what's already happened. So there you see we're 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial, but it's, it's the speed that's incredible. <clears throat> Next one, please. So that's totally human influence. If anyone says that climate change is natural, that's absolute crap. There's an enormous amount of evidence to show that this is human influence and not natural variability. You see what natural variability looks like for the last 2000 years there. So that's what we've been doing to the climate. Next slide, please. So the rates are really, really impressive. Uh, CO2 is rising about a hundred times faster than the maximum rate. CO2 rose after the ice age by about 80 parts per million but we're pushing it up a hundred times faster. Global average temperature about 200 times faster than the background rate over the last 7,000 years and in the opposite direction. But this last comment that just came out last year from the geologist, I think is just really remarkable. These rates of CO2 and temperature change are almost unprecedented in the entire 4.5 billion year history of earth. The only time CO2 and temperature changed this fast or faster was when the meteorite strike hit about 66 million years ago. And that drove temperature in the opposite direction. It cooled it very fast. That's what knocked out the dinosaurs. So no, nowhere in the record can we find temperature rising as fast as it is today. Next one, please. But if you look then, not just at the climate, but at the biosphere it is in general, there was an IPCC-like report that came out in 2019 uh, that looked at what's happening to the biosphere. Next one, please. So they concluded overall that nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. And they have a whole bunch of metrics uh, that take into account both the positive and the negative things. And they say the negative things are dominating at an increasing rate. Next one, please. About 1 million animal and plant species out of about eight or 9 million total species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. And that would push us into the sixth great extinction event in earth history if this happens. Next one. And they conclude the web of life on earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed as, as humans expand and our industries expand. So here we have a climate that's changing extremely rapidly. Uh, and a biosphere that's being degraded. So this is the, 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 the problem we face here as we, we exit the Holocene. Next one, please. Uh, and one of the big risks, of course, is these so-called tipping points and tipping cascades. Jumping now a little bit back to the uh, climate, but the biosphere comes in here with the Amazon, boil force, and so on. These are, are features of the Earth system that there could be ice, could be circulation like the Atlantic circulation, or large parts of the biosphere like coral reefs Amazon boil forest. All of these are now changing, uh, dr driven by climate and direct human activity, uh, changing in a direction of where we think tipping points lie. And the problem is, as these arrows indicate, they influence one another. So the real concern is that there could be a global tipping cascade. Uh, and those of us who work on this published a paper in 2019 saying that um, uh, we don't know where this cascade could start, but it could, we could kick it underway within the next few decades. So it's it's getting pretty serious globally. Next slide, please. Yeah, we made this comment, if damaging tipping cascades can occur, and we're pretty sure they can, and we cannot rule them out, then this is actually an existential threat to civilization. Uh, no amount of economic cost benefit analysis is gonna help us. So that's sort of the, sending the, the, the message to um, th those in power politically that they should really rely a lot more on uh, information coming from science and other areas rather than just economic cost benefit analysis. Next one, please. 
Planetary boundaries. Okay, so that was an intro. intro. Why do we need them? Well, I think I'm, hopefully I've convinced you we need them. They were introduced by Johan Rockström uh, and colleagues in 2009. So they've been around for a bit over a decade. Next slide, please. And this is the classic picture from 2015. Uh, we're updating them now. I don't quite have the numbers yet, but there are nine of them. You can read what they are. They are features of the Earth system. Uh, cl climate change and biosphere integrity are the two big ones. We call them core boundaries. Uh, and then you can see other things, land change, freshwater use, phosphorus, nitrogen, certification of the ocean, and so on. This little radar diagram is designed so that that inner green circle is what we call a safe operating space. Um, if, the, if the control variables for those boundaries are within the green, we're in good shape. Earth is, is stable, it's operating well, and so on. Uh, the uh, yellowy, orangey one, the middle one, that is what we call a zone of increasing uncertainty. In other words, we think we're outside the boundary and things are getting worse. By the time you get outside that in the red, we know we are in really deep trouble. Uh, and the thing that's concerning is that we think we're already in really deep trouble in terms of the biosphere and in terms of biogeochemical flows. But two others have also been transgressed. Climate change is outside the safe zone. That's pretty obvious when you look at the fires, the floods, the heat, and so on. Uh, and land system change. We've changed the land cover of the planet too much. Uh, so that's, that's what it looks like. So we are monitoring uh, control variables all the time on these and seeing what direction they're going. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are going in the wrong direction. Stratospheric ozone is going in the right direction. Uh, that's probably about the only one. Okay, next one, please. So basically, this is the, the idea that, that we're trying to to talk, talk about here. So this line, this blue line, is just the trajectory of the Earth system. And we're going away from the safe space, that's the green. Uh, and where we're sitting now, which is very close to this fork, is in the yellow uncertainty zone in general. And basically within the next decade, we've really got to change direction because the direction we're on, that broken line going up is gonna take us into really dangerous territory uh, within a decade or a few decades. But uh, that, that uh, other, a uh, broken blue line going downwards is getting us back into the safe space. We're not in the safe space today. We've already transgressed Holocene-like conditions. So it's, it's like the previous talk, we're in now a situation of regeneration rather than just maintaining what we've got. We actually have to restore. We have to restore and regenerate parts of the biosphere. We actually have to restore a safe climate uh, by drawing CO2 down out of the atmosphere and so on. So um, one of the points that we make with this, with this boundary framework is that we're already um, in dangerous territory. And to get back to the Holocene, we actually have to become a regenerative uh, society, not an exploitative one. Next one, please. So what, how are these planetary boundaries being used? Well, probably the, the biggest use is in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The boundaries aren't in there per se, but when you look at the 17 SDGs, you'll find uh, the boundaries uh, are, are woven in in various places and at various levels throughout them. So it is one of the guiding principles for how we, uh, how we get back uh, into a sustainable type society. Next one, please. And there are many other uh, uh, activities that are using the planetary boundaries, the OECD, Global Energy Assessments, UNEP. You can read them there, World Economic Forum. So they've actually been widely adopted as a sort of a dashboard for uh, monitoring how we're going um, in, in terms of, of, of global changes uh, and the stability of the system as a whole. Unfortunately, even though we've had almost a decade of uptake of the planetary boundaries, it's hard to see um, a, a really strong influence of this, at least yet. Okay, next one. One of the most interesting applications of the planetary boundaries is by Kate Rayworth, um, an economist from Oxford University. She's developed what she calls donut economics or a safe and just space for humanity. So she's, um, I think quite appropriately saying, we certainly need to observe the planetary boundaries, but we also have a lot of social issues that we have to deal with. So her inner circle of the donut are the social issues. You can read them there, income, education, gender equality, energy, jobs, et cetera. Things that we want to do to create a better society. Uh, but the problem is at present, we're tackling a lot of those, uh, but without regard for the fact that we live on a finite planet. So she says the missing part is that ceiling, the environmental ceiling, and those um, uh, uh, labels up there are in fact the nine planetary boundaries. So she uses the planetary boundaries as the environmental ceiling 
that we should not transgress uh, as we aim to improve the lot of humanity. And the space in between is the safe and just space for humanity. Next one, please. So the, there are a number of bottom line messages that Kate makes in her book, uh, but the three that I really take away is we, we've got to get into the systems thinking uh, and work with dynamic complexity. Right now, our economic system is a highly linear one, just based on GDP and profits and that sort of thing. We need real systems thinking about what are the, uh, <clears throat> what are the, all, all the other uh, side effects of, of our economy, our political system and so on. Uh, we need to really focus on equity we need to develop an economy that's actually distributed by design. So not so that governments have to tax the wealthy and then redistribute the money, that the economic system itself distributes things fairly. Uh, and biosphere, we've talked a lot about this, it has to become regenerative by design. That's how our activities have to be. So it's just a natural thing. It's an economically prosperous thing to regenerate the biosphere rather than exploit it. And those are all things that she has explored in, in her book. Next one, please. And this is what a, a corporation should look like if it's in donut economics. Instead of looking at GDP and where the next resources are gonna come from and all this, they're sitting around a table look, looking at how can we meet this social foundation whilst staying within the environmental ceiling. Uh, and that's again where the planetary boundaries um, can be used. And in fact, they're being up, taken up quite, uh, quite more now by the private sector and companies are trying to use them uh, as some sort of guidance system. So we are making some progress. Um, hopefully we'll make more in the future, but uh, it, it is gaining some traction in the private sector. Next slide, please. So new towards new guidance systems, what do we have to do? Uh, and again, this is a global perspective. We need to slow or maybe even reverse human population growth. So we have a sustainable population of humans on this planet, change our consumption behavior, go to a circular economy, we need some earth system governance systems uh, to manage the system in an equitable way. We don't have that, the UN doesn't work. So we really have a big challenge here. But I think the biggest one is the next one. We gotta change our core values away from growth, away from um, uh, making money, away from, from wealth and all that stuff to establish stewardship of the earth system as a core societal value. In a way we're fortunate in Australia is we have probably the only continuous living civilization on the planet that actually learned how to do that and has been successful for 65,000 years. And that's indigenous Australians who acted as stewards of this continent for a long, long time uh, and kept it in very good, stable, um, sustainable conditions. We've got to relearn that uh, and learn it from our indigenous colleagues here and indigenous people in other parts of the world as well. And we've got to shift our management and governance away from this incremental change and, and toward complexity and uncertainty. We've got to deal with a complex system. We need systems types think, thinking. We have to deal with uncertainty and, and all that sort of thing too. So those are some challenges ahead of us, uh, but that's really what we're gonna to have to do if we're gonna get back within the planetary boundaries. Next, next slide, please. Uh, just to emphasize, I think this is the one we've really got to focus on. If we don't get this one right, the other's not gonna change either. You're not gonna change consumption behavior unless you have change your value system towards stewardship uh, rather than consumption. Next one, please. My colleague, Catherine Richardson actually says it really, really well. Uh, and she reminds a lot of people, particularly those who are into geoengineering and this sort of thing, that we should not be trying to manage the earth system. Uh, that's an absolutely stupid thing to do. We don't know it well enough to manage it. Uh, and we probably couldn't manage it properly even if we did know more about it. We should actually focus on managing ourselves in other words, managing our relationship to the Earth system. So that, that's really where the focus should be. That's what planetary, planetary boundaries are about, to give you a metric at the global scale that tells you, are you pointing in the right direction as we manage ourselves in our activities and so on? Or are we continuing to go in the wrong direction? Next slide, please. So just to finish, uh, as I said, what I've been telling you and showing you is a 2015 planetary boundary assessment. That was the last major one. We're actually working on the one now, which we call three, PB 3.0. Second major updated the original, due out later this year, knock on wood. Um, so what's, what are we doing? We're quantifying the remaining planetary boundaries, a couple of important ones, particularly novel entities. Well, that's new stuff like chemicals, radioactive materials, plastics, all sorts of stuff we're throwing into the planetary environment. Uh, and we need to quantify where the boundary is. 
I think we're going to uh, really annoy a lot of people because the definition of novel entity is it shouldn't be in the Earth system anyway. So we're tending to have a boundary at zero on that. In other words, a totally circular economy. We're going to update the biosphere integrity boundary. That's a really important one because we continue to degrade the biosphere. We need to get better control variables for that so we can measure exactly what's happening. Um, interactions amongst the boundaries, they're not independent. This is one system. We've got to do more on that. And to do that, uh, we're developing an Earth system model with the people in Potsdam in Germany that is stress testing the planetary boundary framework and seeing what happens to the Earth system as we transgress these, these boundaries. Next slide, please. So what, what are we going to uh, come up with? Well, it is likely now that not four, but seven of the planetary boundaries have been transgressed. So this is not good news. What it's telling us that is from our assessment in 2015 to 2021, we are going in the wrong direction. Well, it's no, no surprise to anyone who looked at the IP best report or who looks at IPCC reports. We are going in the wrong direction. Uh, and both of the core planetary boundaries have been transgressed, climate change, and biosphere integrity. There may be a third one, we don't know, and that would be novel entities, but that's also transgressed. So the bottom line is we've really got a lot of work to do to turn this system around and get us moving back in the right direction. Next one. Uh, this is the last one. Um, just a bit of humor at the end. This comes from the Canberra Times, my hometown newspaper, uh, who, who put the uh, Anthropocene, the exiting the Holocene uh, in a rather humorous way. Uh, the problem is that little funny earth with the wheels on it is now further away from the Holocene sign than it was when David Pope actually did this cartoon. So look, I'll, I'll stop there and I apologize again for um, not being able to show these slides myself, but uh, thanks very much at your end for sorting this out. Much appreciated. Okay, Michelle, if there's any other time, I, I would have a few questions. Thank you. Well, we've got a very appreciative 60 or 70 people who've um, very much enjoyed your talk. What I'd like to propose to everyone is because our Regen Brisbane process is going to go for a year or more uh, as we do our community think tank process and bring together um, a bit of a groovy handbook for people to get a, a look across Brisbane. I'd like to say that right now it, we are actually on time if we now stop and allow uh, Kai Lofgren to talk for 10 minutes about um, the donut process they've been doing in Melbourne. But what I can promise is I'm going to invite Will Stefan and perhaps one or two colleagues around the world who are looking at downscaling the big picture planetary boundaries to the local and regional scale. And we'll include that in our program over the next 12 months of fabulous discussions and love-ins. Is that okay? Can you forgive me for no question time if we do that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. You're a total legend okay. and we love your work. And I know there used to be a hug a climate scientist day, but we're all going to send you a virtual hug. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Work. We're, we're on it. We're trying to do our best. So thank you so much, Will. You sure are. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks, Will. Okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. We'll see you soon, Will. Okay. Thanks, guys and girls. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have the opportunity for a big yarn up, but we will. Will's lovely. He comes and talks with Ayla on a whole range of our work on green prints. It is part of our advisory group. So anytime we invite him in for a yarn, we'll bring him in and have a, a decent amount of time to actually talk about what all the, the high level boundary stuff means for stuff at the bioregional and local scale. So now if Kai is still with us, oh, well done, patient gentleman. Hi, Kai. Um, all I wanted to say, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, Green Prince has been under development for about four years and we've been sort of slowly piecing together all of the different approaches that are useful, um, particularly from a community base upwards. Um, and when I saw Kai and the gang start to use the donut um, as a jumping off point for Regen Melbourne, as I said, I thought I'd put the Green Prince surfboard on the regenerative uh, wave. Um, so it's been really inspiring and lovely to see what the Melbourne folks have been up to. And I guess I just wanted to locate donut economics inside the kind of Green Prince approach. One of our steps is actually doing that historical analysis of human impact in a place. And um, after our break, I'm gonna quickly show you some of the lovely images of Brisbane throughout history and throughout time to show you the kinds of changes that have been happening. To me, the donut economic story can be a place to start from, to think about the boundaries, but can also be a place to get to once we've done an analysis of what we've been up to in a place. So it all, it's all a mishmash. Um, and so I'm really delighted that Kai could join us um, and tell us a bit about what they've been up to in Melbourne. Uh, Kai, do you have some slides that you want me to, I'll make you. Hi everyone. 
Uh, yeah, I've got slides, but after watching Will um, <laughs> grapple with them, I'm nervous to press the share screen button. You know, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. You go for it, young Australian, because um, I know we had Will on a tribunal thing last week and he had a similar problem. So I think if you try it, look, it worked. Yay, thank you. The gods of technology don't hate me after all. Okay, so Kai, I'm going to hand over to you now to talk to folks about the process you did. And if you could aim for 10 minutes, that'll keep us on time and we'll all be thrilled. Totally. I, um, firstly, just thanks for having me. Thanks, Michelle, and, and thanks for all the work that you're doing and have done over the years. It's incredibly inspiring. And I must say, you know, having had the privilege of speaking um, in front of lots of audiences over the years, I never been so privileged as to speak after Will Stefan, who's an absolute hero. So I um, feel humbled to be to be speaking alongside him and with all of you today. Uh, I, my name's Kai Lofgren. I work for an organization called Small Giants Academy, which is a, a nonprofit media and education initiative down here in Melbourne. We're all about trying to put empathy back at the heart of leadership and uh, and work together towards what we talk about as the next economy, um, a just transition to something more sustainable for all of us. And so the Small Giants Academy um, does a whole bunch of things, but one of the things that we have been doing a lot more of recently is convening and community organizing. And so at the height of the second lockdown um, in our pandemic last year here in Melbourne, we had a masterclass with Kate Rayworth, uh, where we got together with about 100 people around Australia. Some of you may have been in that room that day and a whole bunch of people in the room put up their hands to say, you know, we want to look at localizing the donut model to Melbourne. And that was the genesis of the Regen Melbourne conversation. So what I'm going to talk to today is, I guess, a little bit of what's happened over the last 12 months. It's almost bang on 12 months now. And then maybe touch a little bit on um, what our plans are from here, because uh, it's a, sort of caught us right at the point in time between transitioning from a community research project, which is what we've been doing, to moving towards a, a sort of an ongoing place-based network for Melbourne. So what was fantastic is that um, Will Stefan just introduced this model to you all, so I don't have to really talk about it, um, except to say that um, if you haven't read the book, I would highly encourage you to get into the details around the model. Um, what is very, what's very famous is, of course, the visual donut, um, but as Will talked about, there's actually seven ways to think like a 21st century economist in the way that Kate talks about this model, only one of which is to change the goal away from a singular view of GDP as success towards the idea of moving our society into the safe and just space of the donut, which is, you know, this hero image of the book. But there are six other ways that are, are equally powerful. You know, Will spoke about this shift from an idea that growth is going to even it up again or clean it up again towards being regenerative and distributive by design. There's um, lots of stuff in there around, you know, we live in a society now, uh, particularly in Australia and in the West, where for the last 40 years, we've equated the economy with the market. So we live in a market-based economy, um, whereas reality, as, as Kate highlights, we live in an embedded economy, which has a market component, but it also has a state component it also has a component that's related to the commons. And then, of course, it has the household where everything begins for all of us every day. So it's sort of a nice way of rethinking, I guess, how we view the economy. So there's lots of elements in there that I won't spend time on today. But I do encourage you, encourage you to have a look at the model in more detail, particularly given it's the methodology that we've used down in here in Melbourne to start having these community conversations. So... Regen Melbourne is a network of about a thousand um, individuals here in Melbourne, but also about 55 organisations that have signed up to be part of this quite exploratory journey um, in rethinking what an economic model could look like for our city. And I'll talk you through where we've got to now. Um, but as you can see, it's a, it's a plethora of organisations, both significant institutions in Melbourne, but also small social enterprises. There's non-profits, there's corporates. Um, and there's also, as I said, a whole bunch of citizens who are really engaged in this conversation, I think partly driven by the sense that the economic system that we're in has been fractur fracturing for a while. Um, and that became incredibly apparent during the pandemic experience that we all had down here in Melbourne. So we got together in October last year and we um, basically decided that there was enough energy here coming out of the second lockdown that we should form a network for citizens of Melbourne to come together and have these conversations. We work together with the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, which is a big community foundation here in Melbourne. And we also partner with the City of Melbourne to develop a small budget for a community research initiative. And that research initiative is kind of what you see here mapped out in these bubbles. 
We had five big community forums in February and March this year, all on Zoom, all online. Um, we had a bunch of leadership interviews with prominent Melburnians across the spectrum um, of that embedded economy. So from business, from the community sector, from, um, from politics, um, and from various elements of the, of the social sector as well. We then developed a whole bunch of insights out of that process, which we presented back to select round tables that I'll speak about in a minute. And then at the end of April, we released a big report and I'll talk about that. But I did just wanna zoom in a little bit on this idea of the community forums, the blue bubbles on the screen here, because um, this is where we really engage with the donut methodology in some detail. And so I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what that looked like. So earlier last year, there was a big methodology that was published um, out of the experiences of three cities overseas. It was Amsterdam, Portland, and Philadelphia. And they had all got together with Kate Rayworth and designed a methodology of downscaling the donut from what is a very macro model, um, as Will said, using the SDGs and the planetary boundaries, which are kind of globally agreed principles. And um, although they work really well at that macro scale, Kate herself recognizes that when you get to the city scale, the uniqueness of each place should influence how that model is developed. And so this uh, creating city portraits methodology, which I'm sure we can share a link to um, in the chat and, and after the session is a really good resource. It provides a bit of a framework for having these conversations. And one of the ways that um, they do that is they break up all of the elements of the donut into um, five sections, five elements. So there's healthy, connected, empowered, enabled, um, and then ecologically healthy cities. And so what you saw the, on the previous slide here is they are the names of the workshops that we had in February and March, a healthy Melbourne, a connected Melbourne, an empowered Melbourne. And in each one of these sessions, we had deep dives. And so I wanna show you the output from the healthy Melbourne session, uh, session that we had. So there's a hundred people talking about what it means to live in a healthy city, how it feels to live in an unhealthy place, and what is our vision for Melbourne as an ultimately more healthy place to live? And you can see there we dove into water and health and housing and food as subsections of this category. And we developed a whole bunch of vision statements and insights, insights for this process. So I just want to give you a snapshot of, of how we did it here. And I'm sure, you know, the, the conversations that you will all be having over the next year um, will, be, will be similar in some ways in terms of the structure perhaps, but of course the insights generated will be unique, unique to Brisbane. And out of this big piece of work, and the report is online at, at regen.melbourne if you wanna have a look, um, it's a 65 page report, but there were really three key elements, three key artifacts that came out of this process that I wanna show you. Um, and I'm conscious of time, but I think this is the sort of the crux of it, these three artifacts. The first one is that out of all of those workshops, we generated a co-created vision statement for Melbourne. So this vision statement basically speaks to what is the city that our network is striving to achieve together. And again, just bear in mind, this is a network of actors across the embedded economy. It's not just the social sector or business, it's really an integrated group. And this vision statement was elevated from dozens and dozens of vision statement contributions from the community we then categorized it into, into areas and then elevated commonly used words. So it really embodies the sense of experience that we had together in the research process. And as you can see there, it's um, some words that you probably you know, recognize and gravitate towards, but maybe I'll share this presentation with you, Michelle, and you can circulate afterwards if you want, if you really want to get into the, the nitty gritty of, it, gritty of it. But we believe that a regenerative Melbourne is knowledgeable, it's full of life, it's affordable and accessible, it's connected through its culture it's collaborative and it's ultimately enabled by the governance and economic systems that surround it. So that final element of the vision statement really speaks to the how, how do we perceive that this can, this can become reality? So that's the first, first artifact, this vision statement for Melbourne. The second one is the adapted donut. So as you can see on the left, that's the, the macro donut that Kate produced. On the right, you've got out of all the process that we went through, some changes that we made to that, to that framework. So the, most, the biggest one that's come out of it for us is that in the SDGs, there's a, um, sadly a lack of commentary and conversation around art and culture. It's not embedded in the model. And yet that is fundamental to what it means to live in a thriving city, it certainly was in the workshops that we ran. So art and culture now forms a segment at the heart of our donut. And we've also got a big conversation around what is the, what is the role of healing and reconnecting, both in terms of 
back to nature and country, but also to one another. And they're sort of precursors to being able to achieve a social foundation or an ecological ceiling. So again, a number of aspects there that, um, that you can drill into and when you have a look at this in more detail. And the final aspect, the final artifact that we came up with was a roadmap. So there are 12 steps that the community came up with that are sort of the first, the ways that we can set ourselves on a pathway to a more regenerative city. And these are in, in, three, in three categories, I guess. The first one is in actualizing the donor. So this beautiful um, image that we've got that we've been playing with is still pretty flat. It requires a huge amount of work to make this an ongoing measure of progress for our city working with universities, working with think tanks in Melbourne who have done a huge amount of research in many of these areas. And our role as a network is to begin to aggregate that existing work and then represent it back to the city through the lens of the donor. So that's the first category of actions. The second one is around community activation and, and going another level deeper into that community engagement process. So working with local councils across Melbourne, as an example. And then the final step there, or the final, um, bunch of roadmap steps is really around how do we build a distributed network for the city? What are the governance systems? What are the beautiful ways that we can design this to really help Melbourne on this pathway that we, we want to go on? And that's what we've been spending a lot of time on over the last month or so, designing the community infrastructure that can hold the network. And so I look forward to sharing a lot more about that in the next month or so as we sort of get towards a, a spring relaunch, hopefully, um, after we've been in our winter hibernation down here in Melbourne. So that's kind of the story until now. And I'm very conscious of time because I know how these forums go. So Michelle, I'll hand back to you. But if anybody has any questions or would like to get in touch, then you can certainly do so through the um, www.regen.melbourne, the website. Um, and I'm very happy if anyone wants to reach out to me directly. Um, so I'm sorry if I sort of sped through that, Michelle, but hopefully that was useful in some way. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We're going to break now. Um, and yes, Kai, if you could send us through your presentation, that'd be lovely. Um, oh, I'm not on. Hang on. I've got to turn myself on, baby. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kai. If you would like to send through that presentation, that'd be lovely. We've got a whole range of things that we'll be sharing with our groups up here. Um, and so now um, we'll say thank you because we're going to break for afternoon tea. Um, it'll be a quick one so we can come back at three o'clock um, and everybody on zoom thanks so much i can see that no one has dropped off which is awesome um not yet anyway please stay with us and um thanks again kai i'm now going to turn the, the mic off here but we'll be back at three o'clock yes let's be back at three o'clock thank you everyone thanks kai all right i'll just hand over to the wonderful marcus foff who got us this gorgeous venue today yay <laughs> One of, the, um, one of the benefits of university restructure is that uh, we find ourselves in the newly formed faculty of creative industries, education and social justice. And so as a result, I've inherited um, the executive floor of the former education faculty, which is now bookable to um, professors like me. And we're gonna make a lot of use of it because in November, we hope to see you all back here for the New Economy Network Australia conference. Um, first week, probably not the dates, I think it's the 5th to the 7th of November. Um, we're gonna be back in here, it's already booked in and we're looking forward to extending and um, broadening the, the conversation. So I am gonna run through a couple of um, slides to give you an idea of what QUT is doing in the space of regenerative um, cities and sustainability more broadly. And then I have two guests that I'm gonna introduce um, um, afterwards for a bit of a conversation and a plenary discussion with, uh, with you guys. So keep your questions and we'll have two experts. who are just very keen on taking up the hot seat over there. So more than human futures, I wanna bring in this um, concept into the conversation because I think it is really, really useful. It actually connects with a lot of debates in the environmental humanities. My own background is actually computer science to all shame, I have to confess this, but um, in my role as a professor in design, I'm connecting these kinds of threads coming from a more technical background, um, also straddling some interest in the built environment and in, in urban informatics and urban design, but drawing a lot of um, theories and methodologies and epistemologies and all those um, fancy words from the humanities and social sciences and bringing them into that technical domain. And so one that I'm really excited about is called More Than Human Futures. Before I delve into this a bit further, um, let me just um, quickly 
mention, now I can see one slide is advancing and the other one isn't. So I'm just, so we are part of the QT Design Lab. You can find out more about the QT Design Lab at um, qt.design. And Shelly is probably outside. The amazing Shelly has been super, super helpful. Please give her a round of applause for organizing the room and the catering and the registration and doing all the logistics in, in the background. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. There we go. Is she putting her head through the door? All right, no worries. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to quickly mention is that we had invited uh, another colleague of mine from QUT, um, Associate Professor Carol Richards, to join us as well, but she um, had to unfortunately send her apologies, but I did want to put in a plug for a project that she's doing together with Lentleys and funded by the um, Food Agility CRC, which is one of the um, national research centers into food cultures and food technology and urban agriculture and ag tech. Um, the reason why this project really stands out, it's because not your usual um, agricultural technology project. What um, Carol is working on uh, together with uh, Lendleys is to try and um, set up and establish a circular economy, a food economy at Yarra Bilba, uh, Yarra Bilba, which is one of the master planned communities that has been developed, built um, out at uh, Logan. And so if you want to find out more about this project, have a look at the Food Agility website. Um, it's called the Yarra Bilba Circular Food Economy. And we will try and twist uh, Carol's arm again to join us at a future event to tell us more about how to do um, radical and outrageous things with a big corporate. Now, the dark side of human-centered design. I have heard a couple of times the, um, this kind of distinction between human-centeredness, but then also having this earth-centeredness um, on some of the slides. And then there was mention again about, oh, we, but we wanna be human-centered, oh, we wanna be earth-centered. So um, we've had this conundrum in our research group. When we started around 2006, our motivation was to actually be moving away from technology-centeredness because around that time, and especially with my background in computer science and technology, everything that was technical was all so exciting. Um, so the question was usually, a new technology comes along, what can we do with it? So it was in a way providing a whole bunch of answers and we were asking, well, what are the questions? So in result, um, in response to that kind of situation, we said, Let's create a group of researchers that are drawing on a lot of the methodologies from the humanities and social sciences to be much more human centered. So from 2006 onwards, the way that our group um, formed and tried to be very interdisciplinary was by borrowing from the people, place and technology kind of triad, but to be really, really human centered. What we've now arrived at is really a situation where we realize that we're actually complicit in some of the um, challenges and planetary ecocides that we are witnessing all over the place. And so we've started to reflect on, on this kind of complicity and what we're gonna do about it. And that's exactly where we started to, to discover and trying to reflect on these um, theories as well as um, some of the um, concepts that are coming out of the environmental humanities. So I'll go through these a couple of slides relatively quickly. Um, we had already uh, a much more sophisticated presentation that I'm uh, not going to repeat here around the planetary boundaries, the issues to do with um, the rise in carbon emissions and, and so forth. What is also interesting is that the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth report is getting uh, another look at, and in fact, um, a lot of the original, uh, I suppose, authors are starting to um, trying to compare some of these projections with what's actually now happening as a retrospective reflection to, to kind of say, well, we told you so. So a lot of this kind of stuff we are talking about is actually not that new. We knew this from uh, for a long time. I think this was released in uh, 76, 72, 72, there we go. Um, what we've done more recently is look into a comparison of the different building assessment frameworks that we're using in the built environment. And so you can see them there on the left side. Um, you might recognize the green building staff framework here in Australia. There's also LEED 
and Bream and others, what these systems do is they tell um, construction companies, architects, um, those industries in the built environment, what is sustainable. Well, it is sustainable if you do well in these kinds of KPIs. So we've done that and compared it with the kinds of expectations and aspirations that we should be following if we were to listen to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And what we obviously found is that there is a gap. And this gap is really interesting because what it actually um, alludes to is that these efficiency gains that a lot of these frameworks are telling us are something that we need to aspire towards, they're not gonna cut it. They're not good enough. So um, the, the sad news really is that all the kinds of electric vehicles, um, LED lights, um, water efficient shower heads that are constantly telling us here's something that is more efficient than the previous one, that is still not going to be good enough. And the Jeevan's paradox is an economic concept that actually is telling econ uh, economists um, why that is. And there is the, the reason. Technological progress or government policy increases the efficiency with which a resource is used, but the rate of consumption of that resource rises due to increasing demands. And so in this particular graph that we used in that article, you see the energy footprint of buildings. And whilst these buildings are constantly made more efficient, we actually just happen to build more and more and more of them, which means that we are still um, in absolute terms exceeding our um, carbon footprint and our planetary boundaries. And this is kind of what um, was an editorial that really nicely summarized it and what I refer to a lot, which is um, an opinion piece in The Guardian. It's already from uh, 2017, but I think it's still very valid today, which um, talks about how neoliberalism has conned us into fighting climate change as individuals. So it's a constant um, delegation of responsibility back to the consumer to make the right choice. Who took public transport? Who used um, a bike or walked here? Oh, well done. Well, the actual responsibility or the shaming of those that drove is not um, a fair kind of way to go about sustainability when we uh, conveniently ignore the responsibility that the system needs to carry for having a terrible public transport system in a particular city or for having um, insecure bike paths in the city and so forth. So um, the article, and there's others of this kind, that are talking about how, yes, we have to um, pay attention and do the small things, but we shouldn't um, pay attention just to the small things as a way to distract us from dealing with and tackling the much bigger systemic kinds of changes we need to do. And this is for Michelle, the Wombat story. Um, so one of the projects we do in the QED Design Lab is a bit of an outlier, but I really, really like it. It has been a bit of a hobby of mine and a volunteer effort. I've been working with a wombat sanctuary near Canberra, and I've taken that project that was really done in my personal capacity into my research capacity. And so what we have been doing together with Australia's largest wombat sanctuary, Sleepy Burrows, is we are starting to build um, hospital burrows, quarantine hospital burrows to treat wombats that are suffering from mange. Mange comes from a um, disease uh, that is uh, called sarcoptic sac mite that borrows into their skin. It pretty much eats the wombat alive over um, months. It's a very agonizing death. One of the colleagues at UTAS, at the University of Tasmania, was on ABC um, 7 p.m. news saying it's the most agonizing disease of any disease in the animal kingdom. Now, why do I mention this in the um, context of regenerative cities? Um, this is what it sadly looks like at an advanced stage. One of the interesting pieces of research connects the mange disease with urban infrastructure and what we are doing in the built environment. And this is why. This is a project done by Western Sydney University and colleagues down there that's called WOMSAT. And so you can see um, sightings of wombats across uh, parts of uh, New South Wales in this case. The research that was done um, in conjunction with CSIRO um, researchers found that those wombat populations that were um, cut off from other wombat populations, so they couldn't visit their mates and they couldn't interbreed, they had a DNA that was less resilient to the mange disease. So pretty much if you build infrastructure that cuts off wombat populations from each other, then they start to interbreed and some Australian wildlife um, are not taking that quite as easily. It doesn't occur, for instance, with the Brisbane possum. 
So possums in Brisbane are all brothers and sisters with each other, and they seem to be fine. So they all interbreed, nothing to worry about. Wombats, not so much. So you see there's a, um, a, a direct co correlation between infrastructure decisions and investments that we make and the impact it has on our wildlife that isn't often um, anticipated or even um, taken into consideration. There's obviously far more explicit impacts as well. Um, I'm not even sure if this figure is still correct. I think it's from 2019. This is the percentage of electricity usage of everything digital. So everything that is in the cloud actually consumes 10% of our entire electricity footprint. And by now it probably is higher. I'm looking at David, he's already nodding. Um, so this is uh, creeping up quite phenomenally. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because a lot of the time we look at technology as a savior. We have energy monitors, we got air pollution monitors, we got internal things that are, are collecting data about a whole bunch of things within the city so that the city can have dashboards and these days things called digital twins. And so those give us an insight of what kinds of decisions we should be making in order for the city to become sustainable. What we don't necessarily take into the equation is the energy footprint as well as where those devices came from and where they're going. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna do a little slideshow. Um, so this one here is from the Washington Post. They did an investigative journalism piece where they followed the supply chain for lithium ion batteries. And one um, crucial element in lithium ion batteries is cobalt. Cobalt or the majority of cobalt used in not just your mobile phones, you probably all have a little bit of cobalt in your pocket. If you drive an electric vehicle, you're sitting on a lot of cobalt um, on top of your battery. Um, the majority of that comes from the Congo. The Congo doesn't have any kind of regulation when it comes to the mining of that cobalt. And so what happens is that there is pretty much gig economy workers, same as Deliveroo or Uber, they're all working on their own. They're digging tunnels. They're going up to seven meters into the ground to try and find cobalt. If it gets too small, they send their children down there. Once they found enough cobalt, they um, have local economies, informal economies, where that material gets gathered and then put onto a wholesaler, another retailer, another wholesaler, until eventually it goes to BMW, to Tesla, to Apple, to Samsung, and to LG, and so forth. So when those um, corporations are saying, well, our supply chain is fully um, sustainable and accountable, it's not because the fine granularity of the supply chain infrastructure in those supply uh, countries doesn't account for a lot of um, these kinds of footprints. And there's a huge problem also with regards to the way that sustainability then is um, outsourced. So we're kind of thinking that, oh, Brisbane is a, is a very green city. We've made all these investments into green uh, infrastructure and technology, but we actually not uh, necessarily take into account the effect it has on um, the way we are contributing to detrimental effects elsewhere. Um, so this is at the cradle. This is the grave of the supply chain when it comes to things that designers call planned obsolescence. So the devices are designed to fail at a certain point so that you buy another one, a new version. Um, this is recycling. This is from another report in China. Um, and then uh, the e-waste, if it can't be recycled, it ends up uh, in various places. This is a video, and I'm happy to share these slides um, with you to have a look at it. It's quite um, eye-opening. This is a particular site in uh, Accra, uh, in Ghana, where a lot of the e-waste of the world gets accumulated. So this is really the question we started with, which is we have this complicity in the design process of cities what are we gonna do about it? We might feel that this is a great investment at face value, but once we scratch the surface, we actually realize there's more to it. So what we are trying to do now in the last couple of years and what we are still in the process of doing in the QD Design Lab is to imagining post-anthropocentric cities. And some have said, well, actually, is it really the human's fault? Is it the human that's the problem? Or is it the capital system that's the problem? So they've called it or renamed it the post-capitalocentric um, city to point the finger not at us as individuals 
but the economic system that is in place. Um, some of the things, green buildings, and I'm going to um, have um, Anne and David, if you guys want to maybe start taking a seat because I'm going to uh, launch into a bit of a Q&A in a second. Um, but I quickly mentioned some of the uh, more than human ideas. It comes from this book that I um, very strongly recommend if um, people haven't seen or read it yet by David Abram from about 96. Um, it's called The Spell of the Centuries, Perceptions and Language in a More Than Human World. And it talks about how we've um, unlearned to understand the language of nature, uh, particularly by actually learning how to read and write. So the ability of us to read and write a particular script has actually um, caused us to unlearn our um, ability to, to sit with nature, to reflect uh, on nature and to be attuned with nature. And he talks about examples from various places, uh, places uh, across um, the planet where that is still intact, where that still occurs. This has been translated into a whole bunch of different concepts I'm not gonna go into, but you can see that there is quite a genealogy of different uh, ideas that have mushroomed and they're all begging to be translated into actionable kinds of um, items. One of the core cool ones I really, really like is by my colleague, Laura Forlano. She talks about decentering the human in the design of collaborative cities. And I thought this concept is gonna be really applicable for our ideas of a regenerative city, which is how we, and this aligns with what Michelle said earlier about earth jurisprudence and moving to an earth-centered system, how we need to, before we are actually able to do that, we've got to decenter the human in order to um, dethrone the, the human from its um, position of exceptionality. I'll give you one example. The Goodwill Bridge that is um, at Gardens Point, everyone likes fairy lights. Well, <laughs> We've done a study where we looked mm -hmm. at these kinds of light installations, including the other end of the spectrum. Um, I can't remember which Chinese city this is. Uh, does anyone recognize it? They have um, the entire city skyline synchronized so it can be animated at night uh, across the entire um, facade of skyscrapers. Now, this has a huge impact on light pollution and the way that um, Insects, for instance, are attracted to lights and die. But you also have examples like this, which is not insects. This is actually birds, migratory birds that come from Canada. They want to go to Mexico and they get trapped in the, um, at this time, they got trapped in the World Trade Center's tribute lights because those were such high lumen uh, beams that um, they started circling and expanding all the energy that they would use to do their migratory flight until they would just fall dead on the ground. In this particular case, they realized what was going on. They switched off these tribute lights, but you can see the conflict between what humans would appreciate, the mourning, the loss, the history, versus what um, the environment might, might need. Uh, here's another example of glowworms in Bristol. And I also like this example, and um, maybe Anne and David will comment on this, which is a different assessment framework for the built environment called the living building challenge which is more inclusive with regards to not just focusing on numbers on energy but also looking at criteria like beauty equity um, health and happiness um, so we started to form this group within the design lab called the more than human futures research group um, this picture is right next door from where i live i thought it just really illustrates the kind of human dominance um, where the electricity pole is dominating this majestic tree that now has um, a huge hole in it in order to make way for our electricity consumption. We talked about the uh, more than human media architecture, the example of the Goodwill Bridge, for instance, in some research papers. And we are also starting to identify new methods to be more participatory. Jonathan Shree earlier talked about participatory budgeting, but the participatory budgeting still relates to having humans participate in the budgeting. What we are trying to do is have a participatory approach to the more than human. How would we include a earth-centered approach to a participatory democracy? Um, this is coming out very, very soon. Things we could design for more than human worlds by my colleague at Simon Fraser University, Ron Wakari. But um, I'm gonna leave it at that. There's another one bad picture for Michelle. <laughs> and, <laughs> turn our conversation to our two guests here. There is Dr. Anne Kovacevic, who's the leader of um, um, Foresight, 
at ARIP here in Brisbane, but actually with res responsibility for all of Australia, Australasia, and David Hood, who is an expert in um, everything sustainability, a fellow, life fellow of the en uh, Engineers Australia. Honorary fellow. Honorary fellow, <laughs> Engineers Australia, and a fellow of the Climate Council, I believe. Is that right? No, I no, think no. I... Fellow of BZE, Beyond Zero Emissions. I should have probably looked this up further, but uh, David has kindly agreed to jump in really, really quickly because Carol wasn't able to make it. And so I twisted his arm just in the afternoon break. Oh, yes, I'll probably step out so that this camera can see these two having a chat. Uh -huh. So what I really wanted to start with, and you guys got the microphones yep. on, yeah, is um, you both have this wealth of experience of um, trying to translate some of these radical, what we believe at the moment should really be mainstream ideas, but the rest of society probably thinks of this as radical ideas into the world and translating them through systems of governance, systems of corporate frameworks. What are some of the kinds of friction points when this is kind of translated into real world projects? Are there any examples that you might um, can think of and share with us where these kinds of different worlds have collided? Sure, you want to go first? Or? Politics. I mean, I stopped talking to politicians about 15 years ago yeah. because they just glaze over when you start talking sustainability or climate action. And a, a terrific example was uh, when the uh, go between bridge was open and I was on Campbell Newman's sustainability committee at the time he was the Lord Mayor. And I was riding my bike across there and he pulled up and said, hey, David, don't you like this bridge? It's very sustainable. And I said, uh, how is that Lord Mayor? And he said, well, it's opening up access across to the art center of Brisbane. That's a societal thing for sustainability. And I said, oh yeah, I'm not sure about that, but um, you know, so. Then he told me, now what about my Clem 7 tunnel, David? Could you get your new ISCA, the Infrastructure Sustainability Rating Scheme, which we just launched at the time, could you get that to rate this tunnel for me? And I looked at him and said, uh, Lord Mayor, I don't think that's a very good idea, unless, of course, you use it as a water storage device. <laughs> he didn't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the problem. It's politicians that don't understand, don't want to understand. And the other thing I'd say, Marcus, is education awareness building is critical. And as we get our school kids to start understanding this, it's happening, but not fast enough. So, and uh, would you agree with David? We, we got, you know, QT graduates coming out of their degrees, engineering, design, maybe they started Arup. Um, do they fall into that kind of real world thinking, I got all these great ideas and now I'm being put into a core set of reality? Uh, I think so. Um, I think, yeah, you do get grounded in, um, and I think the other problem is uh, sort of expectations of this is how we design things. And as we saw with the frameworks, and as, as we know, we have this um, benchmark of this is how badly I would do something. And therefore, if I do that less badly, then we give it a, an award. So it's, um, we've been talking about sort of this, this positive positive development with, um, mm. is, is where I started with it with um, Janice Birkeland mm. um, about 10 years ago, I used to tutor with Janice. And, um, and, you know, I think we've been talking about a lot of this stuff with regenerative, um, regenerative design or whatever term we're using for it that week um, um, for a number of years. And I think we're still sort of um, recalibrating what we think about it as, as we learn more. And I think um, it's, it's partly to do with um, with education, but I think also partly to do with say, like when we do get the graduates out that are, you know, bright eyed and, and really want to be able to do things, we need to be embracing that and using that thinking rather than um, sort of squashing that and going back to, mm -hmm. to old techniques. And I think, you know, we do, we do see that a lot, particularly with digital tools coming in that um, essentially sort of uh, allow for more innovation at that, um, at that early scale stage of, of career and things like that. Yeah, yeah, great. For those not familiar with Janice Birkeland's work, Janice uh, in uh, QUT's honour was actually a professor here in the School of Design, is now in Melbourne. Um, do, you, do you want to quickly maybe just summarise what's meant by, what's this net positive development concept that, that Janice has been um, calling for or, or sure. pioneering? Yeah, so basically um, net positive development, um, looking at how uh, basically cities or developments can uh, come out more positive than when they start. So it's not just nature-based, but also societal, um, uh, societal and um, uh, economic 
um, improvement of an overall system. So making sure we're thinking of things in design and also um, and as the systems approach and be benchmarking off um, a system rather than off a, um, a number that's um, uh, not, um, not something we should be benching off, benchmarking off. Uh, did you want like, to chime in? I just want to add yeah. to that, that one of the issues that uh, Janice and I talked about a lot when I was here at QUT um, was that the green systems that we have are all about minimising negative impacts. Mm -hmm. And so you get a six star green star building and the developer says, look at me, I'm saving the world. And he goes and does another 10 of them. And that's six times, 10 times the minimal impact that's caused, which is probably worse than if the building was a dog at the first place. So what we tried to do in, in Net Positive and what we did with ISCA when we started to develop the rating tool for infrastructure was to make sure that we didn't have any criteria which limited the jump from minimising negative into positive. See, a lot of the Green Star rating when they were first developed had a sort of a, you know, you can't go any further. You're minimising and you can't go any further. And that was the mentality of developing it, just minim keep minimising. And that's because I guess the Green Building Council was started with big end of town and they didn't want to go too far. Uh, whereas with ISCA, we started with a lot of the designers before we got into the big construction companies, which might have done the same pressure on ISCA. Um, can I just take you up on a couple of issues? One, I was disappointed you didn't mention ISCA in that list of the green rating tools you had, having put so much of my life into it. <laughs> which one, the green, <laughs> green building? It, no, building yeah. focus, wasn't it? <laughs> it? ISCA, the Infrastructure Sustainability Rating Scheme. Oh, yeah, we the will add tool. it. And secondly, um, you mentioned 10% of the energy going into the cloud. Some work that, were, that I did here with uh, the Long Future Foundation and QUT was to look at Bitcoin. If Bitcoin got to be a million dollars each, and the other day it was at $60,000 a coin, and Wall Street is gambling on it getting to a million dollars, you know how you mine Bitcoin. The algorithm on your computer solves a, a, a problem to demonstrate work, and the work increases as the value goes up. So to mine more Bitcoin, you've got to have more ASCII computers and they consume energy. And what the sums we did in terms of consumption of energy to mine a million dollar Bitcoin would consume 60% of the generation of electricity on the planet. So Bitcoin, if it's allowed to go to a million dollars, would destroy everything because of the way they mine it. And there is people moving now to, to different systems that do it differently through... Yep. Proof of authority and that's right. other yeah. kinds of ways, but let's let's go back to the um, um, focus of cities and, and regenerative cities. What what I'm really interested in is the way that architects, but also other kinds of professionals in the built environment, they think of cities through either maps or spatial kinds of representations. But in essence, the lot, the lot as in the square. The square could be you know irregular. It could be a precinct. But what it actually then um, begs the question about is what is outside the square in terms of the circle of influence, or in this case, the the circle of in, uh, the um, the square of influence. So your your comment earlier about, for instance, the the political side, um, what is the ability for us to have something that is equivalent to you know transdisciplinary that connects the regulatory and political side together with the commercial side, because those seem to be the kinds of entities that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the mainstream of society. Whereas what we are currently doing is being part of civil society and community advocacy and community activism. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to protest. And we heard Jonathan, for instance, saying, well, civil disobedience, or all those kinds of mechanisms of democracy. What are some <laughs> of the ways to work on the inside to bring about change? Have you any recipes for us? Any kinds of tips or tricks of what You're else we should consider? Oh, well, um, I mean, obviously, as as part of an engineering company, we do lots of different projects. And, you know, if, um, I, I would say as our, I mean, uh, very sustainably driven and um, uh, we actually have the planetary boundaries as one of our underpinning um, principles for our sustainable um, development plan. But that's still, you know, within that, like there's, we do do projects that, um you know, you sort of question like, oh, how, how good could we do this? And we, and we might have ones, you know, if we're building, a, uh, if there's a highway, like, is that a project that we're going to be wanting to be working on? And, and you know, there's all sorts of questions that we have in we, within our internally to, to think about what we want to be spending our time on, what, what we want to do, and, and also, you know, how far do we push things? And I think um, there's always... Um, 
sort of a, an, an ethical discussion about, you know, um, well, ethical and also an ability to, to make change where we have a number of people that will go in and, you know, we're really trying to push things as far as we can. And um, certainly with the regenerative design work that we're doing at the moment, um, as part of my group as um, Foresight and Innovation, it would be sort of, um, this is how we can push things a little bit further. So we're, we're developing um, a framework that will work on all of our projects. Um, we're uh, quite, um, we want to make sure that we create something that will actually be used and always be pushing things in the right direction. Um, and so we're really breaking it down. And from the point of the, um, the block, I suppose, like we, we've been looking at that at a number of different scales. So we have anything from um, the material scale up to the biosphere scale. So we're really trying to, to say, you know, like what are, what are the small elements within your project that you, that you can make change on, but also um, uh, how does that fit into the larger system up to the planetary boundaries? Um, but also um, not just breaking things down into parts the way we always do, but mm -hmm. uh, how do we pull it back together and think of that system? Because like with um, uh, uh, regenerative design, we, uh, we want to be thinking about um, how do these elements have multifunctions or how, how do these elements uh, uh, remain flexible so they can be they're there for whatever futures that we have that we don't know, but we don't want to over-design so that they're fit for any any future will ne never fall down, um, and that way we that the way we design them so that we're sort of wasting things, but making sure that we're able to uh, um, design so that we can um, change that use in the future. I think we're both engineers, um, <laughs> so one of the problems that engineers have, and it's been my career, particularly in recent times in education is getting engineers to stop putting boundaries around their stuff. You know, they, they come up with an elegant design of the solution within a physical boundary. They don't sort of think outside those boundaries. Now, the problem with, with that is that you then bugger up some environment that you don't care about, or you don't think about sourcing your material or waste of your material or the emissions and so on. The other problem that with engineers have is that they put boundaries around their teams. They tend to only focus on engineers in the team and maybe the architects force their way in because they've got to get the design right for the thing. And a couple of anecdotal stories. Um, the first relates to uh, a project when I was in the Air Force years ago, I brought an anthropologist in on one of my projects and the bloody engineers that were working in the team looked at me and said, what the bloody hell are you doing bringing an anthropologist in here? What, what's that? About? And she was a woman too and all the rest were men. So there was a double whammy for me in this. But I said to the guys, look, who's going to work in this building we're going to design here? Uh, 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 military people? People! So shouldn't we have an anthropologist that understands human interactions and people movements and things? And at the end of that project, one of the guys came and said, Jesus, Hoodie, that was the best thing you've ever done. I learned so much from that woman. So that you need to expand your team boundaries. And the second one was uh, I was uh, in aviation for my early part of the career and I was uh, branch head of planning for Perth Airport. Who knows Perth Airport? Where's the international terminal? So we did a big master planning exercise and we designed the best place for the international terminal was next to this domestic terminal. They're right next to each other. So people often fly internationally, get on a domestic flight. And so we did all the design and did a terrific master plan. We took it to the minister, did a big presentation, the team did a great job. And all of a sudden the minister got up and said, uh, excuse me, David, the international terminal is going there, not there. And you know where it is now. It's 22 kilometres from the domestic terminal around the right, around the end of the runway and all the way back into the international terminal. It is actually 22 kilometres. And we were shattered. We all went out and got drunk that night. Because my team, and it's probably my fault as the leader of the team, did not understand the political ramifications of noise now, we'd, we'd shown the minister that the noise from aircraft starting up and pushing back and taxing was far less than the runway noise, and it wouldn't have made any difference where the terminal was. And that the efficiency of having it next, see, this is efficiency coming in again, of having it next to the domestic terminal was going to save heaps of, of time for business people and all that sort of stuff in the long term. He just said, no, terminal's going over there. And where is the terminal right now in Perth? It's where he wanted it. We had failed to understand the ramifications of the political impacts of our project because there were heaps of residents living within 100 metres of the area we were going to build the international terminal. And he was a local member 
And he had gone round all the councils, talking with the people, talking with the councillors, and he had a better understanding of the situation than we did as, a, as the design team for this project. So you need to expand your team to make sure you cover off everything. And this is the problem with engineers. I don't know if you're yeah. seeing this. Well, Arup's on... one of the companies that I admire. <laughs> yeah, we're, best, yeah. I, I've been at Arup for nine years now, and I was just saying to Marcus earlier, um, over that nine years, I've seen a substantial change in the people that we have within um, an engineering company. And to the to the point where it, I, I'm sort of surprised when I see an engineer being hired because we have so, <laughs> so many other disciplines. Um, we have a lot of people upstream really understanding what the problems are, the planners and master planners, um, really getting in and um, being trusted advisors to clients so that they can understand the problem so we can sort of match the problem rather than just get to a, a brief that comes out and then have to do that. So we can influence upstream, we can be saying, oh, well, maybe if we could do it in this different way and therefore be um, getting a better project out of that and, you know, then, then being able to get better outcomes and really driving mm -hmm. it that way. So uh, I think we have a number of different people and then all of the other skills that go, go with it that are required at the moment. So like our ecologists that, always you know always in demand um, the landscape architects always um, working on all of our projects and and again in demand so we have all of these um, different skills that have really become much more prevalent um, over that time and leading in thank diversity. you both so much sorry. it's yeah. sorry we are unfortunately we're out of time but it's a really good story to end on because it kind of fast forward today and we just were very, very briefly talking okay. about the Olympics. Um, and the announcement I think was just made yesterday that the Olympic Village is gonna be right under the flight path um, in Hamilton. And the quarantine facility is right at the end of the runway. So I don't know who wants to quarantine in Brisbane or who wants to be an athlete at the Olympics um, 2032, but they will have 150 flights a day up to uh, a flight every two minutes. Um, according to some of the modeling that we've been doing. Um, please join me in thanking both Anne and David so much for joining us. And I'll hand back over to Michelle. Thank you kindly. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. I am so proud of you. You're still here. You haven't run away. It's been a long day. But what we're going to do now is um, we're going to end with a lovely discussion between Mary Lou um, Kelly from Green Tag International, because I thought it was a, I tried to, to curate today's program so that we could start from, you know, Indigenous knowledge and wisdom and relationist ethos, and then thinking more and more about our love of place and thinking about the bioregion and the catchment. We've got a little bit more of that story to tell, so I'll do that first. And then I was really pleased um, for Marcus to focus in on cities and urban issues. And uh, thank you so much, Marcus. It was really excellent to hear the kind of critiquing and thank you of course to David, particularly for jumping in so quickly um, and our Arab visitor. It's always great to hear people um, thinking uh, in a regenerative fashion from the business side of things. And that's actually one of the reasons I also wanted to invite Mary Lou to speak today because she's got an interesting story given the huge amount of work she's done on looking across sustainability initiatives. Um, but so before we jump into that, what I'd like to do is just recap with a couple of slides on some of the work um, around the bioregional governance, just to resituate ourselves and to go back into place. Uh, thank you. So thanks for your patience, folks. Um, this is where we finished when we were talking about green prints and we did our biodiversity bingo game. And of course the blue banded bee. But what I wanted to share with you was when we started to talk about planetary boundaries and donut economics, um, these are really critical and critically important issues. But from the green prints perspective, the economics stuff comes after the human and the interconnected and the living world stuff. That doesn't mean that it's less important, but often what we seem to forget in the Western world is that, that lovely quote by Einstein, you know, we can't get out of the problems we've created by using the same thinking that got us into it. And if we jump straight into whether it's um, uh, material flow analysis or um, any of the kind of quantification of life, if we start there, then we're automatically using a framing that's been designed by the industrialized societies to get themselves out of their mess. And that's really great. But what I just wanted to remind us is that to understand our city and to understand this place, we have to shed ourselves of all of those other created frameworks and get back to the reality of the plants and the animals and the river system. So in our, when we do an afternoon workshop on green prints, we actually run through the process and have discussions with local folks. We have coloring in, we have maps, 
we have um, exercises about, you know, what is your special place? And we start with that. Where do you go to relax? Where do you? And then we talk about what's happened over time to that place. So people really take the time to kind of bed themselves down into place. So what I wanted to do was just quickly um, put us back into the green prints process and actually share with you, because it's late in the afternoon and you've been awesome, some photos and images of Brisbane throughout um, just a tiny snippet of some of its story. And then Mary Lou and I will finish today with some of her really, I think, really important insights into what business folks who want to do the right thing are struggling with, with the current systems that we've been trying to, to develop. So, of course, the Brisbane story starts with the Mianjin, and I always say it wrong, Mianjin story. And um, what I wanted to do was just pay homage to where I live in Banyo in North Brisbane, which is now the remnants of the most remarkable wetlands that must have existed before we piled a highway and an airport and a service station and a whole bunch of other things. There were literally, and I remember talking to an old Indigenous fellow years ago, and he had grown up in that area and all the oldies told him that that whole um, sub-region was just wetlands and marshlands and they had pathways through, they would collect eggs, they would collect bush foods, of course, bush foods, it was called food, um, medicines, and then go out to the beach and out to the oceans. And their cycles and their seasons were fitting in and around the mangroves and the waterways. And the Nudgee uh, waterhole, which is this photo, which I often use to acknowledge country, um, if you ever get to go there, it's this kind of remarkable, beautiful remnant surrounded by highways and cars and a roadhouse. But I go there and I block out the rest and I pay homage to this incredible place and say hi to the turtles and the water lilies. So to wrap up today, before we go back into discussions about the techniques we can use to get ourselves out of the mess we made, I do invite you to think about which bits of Brisbane or your home or your backyard or that one tree that you love. Because as I said, it's only love that's gonna get us out of this. Think about those places that you care about and what you can do to contribute back because the reciprocity is a huge issue and it's actually a really good part of the donut economic framework is how we give back, but it's obviously embedded so deeply into indigenous philosophy and governance. So um, I showed you this um, image before, but I guess it's just another reminder that historically this region was remarkably abundant with life. Um, uh, the Aboriginal peoples of this place um, had an unending supply of companions, evolutionary companions or spiritual companions, however you want to look across that landscape. And I love how Mary Graham says, she's always surprised when some people talk about, you know, the openness and the unique, uh, the desolation of the Australian arid environment or this and that. And she says, it's jam packed with life. Everywhere you go, it's noisy. There's the plants, the animals, the ancestors, the spirit beings, it's just jam packed with life. And so when I see these old maps, that's what I remember uh, or am reminded of how much life was here before we took some of it down. Um, and it was lovely to hear Kira talk today about how much life there is in the, the creeks and the catchments, because that's the beautiful stuff. That's the stuff we can continue to support and bring back. So the, just quickly, these are some of the early drawings of um, the colonizers in the 1850s. Impressions of the Moreton Bay hinterland in the first decade of European settlement. I'm just going to move through these quickly and a huge thank you to James for finding some of these um, images that we can use today. Um, and this quote here, um, according, oh, I've got that little doobie in the way. Go back. Ah. According to the initial stuff, about 80% of Queensland's land surface, including the catchments of the Moreton Bay rivers, supported forests, shrublands and heathlands until non-Indigenous settlement began. And I think history is wonderful depending on who writes it and how we look at it. But even remembering that this is what places look like in such a short amount of time. This is 1855, South Brisbane from the North Shore. The image above is from 1881. And if anyone's been to the um, art gallery here in Brisbane, um, that panorama of Brisbane is a spectacular, I think it's like 12 feet. It's a massive painting. Um, and it's really worth having a look at to just see where things were and where they are. You can see old customs house, was one of the biggest buildings in the area. Now, just think about that for a moment, 1880. You know, Australia is one of the youngest colonial countries in the world. That means, number one, we've created havoc in a small amount of time, but we also have a remarkable opportunity to reconnect with what was here, particularly in Queensland, you know, pre-1850s. We're not even talking about 1788 when we talk about Brisbane. 
This is just an example. This is um, a wonderful one that James found, 1925. This is when they amalgamated the 21 shires that created the Greater Brisbane City Council. There's a whole story about the governance of this place from having a governor to being a separate colony, to having a different railway gauge to New South Wales, to struggling and being cranky about becoming part of the Federation, to ditching one of the, um, uh, the, the upper house in the political system. We are still the only state in Australia that doesn't have a, um, a two, uh, two houses in our parliamentary system. How embarrassing. Anyway, I digress. Um, here's just a random photo from 1937. Invasive water hyacinth clumps floating down the river. But look at that. That's just before the Second World War. Look at the, the, the height of the buildings and the place that we now call home. Now we're moving into, um, this is the 1930s. 64, you can still see the river and the buildings in the background. The city starts to expand. A lot of those outer areas and the white areas haven't, haven't actually even got houses in them yet, but this is from the late 60s, a, a lovely map of the city really forming up around the river and getting more and more into the modern times. And I can never get rid of this doobie here. Hide floating meeting controls. Thank you, bugger off. All right. So these, this is the 1980s through till today. So on the one hand, Brisbane is still an incredibly livable city compared to many other places around the world. But if we wanna be part of um, a movement to really make sure the city is in fact regenerative, we have to think a lot about what that means. And I'm really, as I said, looking forward to tomorrow's discussion about looking at where things are being used, where things go to um, and what we're generally getting up to in the city. And so that to me is where the economics comes in. Not at the beginning. We don't do an analysis of, of how we change the economy first, although the New Economy Network Australia was built deliberately to help people engage in community-based conversations about what economic system we want. But for us, the Green Prince approach is all about connecting to the place first, connecting to the indigenous wisdom and slowly weaving our way through the story of what is actually possible in this place. And then thinking about what economic activities are suitable to be built in this place. And the resources we take from here or from other places, what are the impacts of, of those behaviors? So I'm not gonna talk about this. I had just had some of these slides ready for folks if they had, if we had had time for questions. Um, this was the first donut and that's the Melbourne one. The Green Prince steps under each of these have a whole range of thinking and ideas and tools. Um, and as I said, the website will be up soon and we're hoping um, with um, lots of people coming together that they might be of use as the scaffolding underneath much more advanced conversations than we've had today. Today's been this wonderful kind of looking across the top of a lot of these really important issues. But what I wanted to mention um, just quickly before I bring Mary Lou to come and have a chat is as we develop scenarios for change for our place, we really need to think about the economic activities, but also the business activities and how we locate all of the things that we do into our place and as good citizens and neighbors. Um, I think that's all I wanted to do was just to bring us all back to that. What I would like to do now is just um, let Mary Lou chat about her experiences thinking about moving beyond sustainability and the tools that she's been encountering and um, what we can get up to next together. Thank you, Mary Lou. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Oh, there. Okay, there we go. Not big, good, small, excellent. I won't keep you long. Um, I've been in sustainability for 28 years. Most of you probably have as well. David Hood, you've probably been in it for 40 years. Um, for me, it has been quite a rational journey. So it's been quite a headbound adventure. And even though we have created an eco label called Global Green Take and Delwyn Jones works with us, who was Queensland's um, ex-principal uh, scientist and is uh, irreplaceable in her work. Uh, yay. <laughs> she really is. She really is. Hang on to her. Um, whilst Global Green Tag plays its role and it continues to play its role and it continues to expand as an eco-label for life cycle analysis of building materials. We're going into fashion, we're doing shoes now, we're doing uh, cleaning products, et cetera, all the products you can do. We can, we're not doing agricultural products though. 
it appeared to me about three years ago that even though it was deep green, it was possibly the best standard on the planet for an eco label. It wasn't, it was missing something and I didn't know what it was missing. So Danelle here today, uh, I said to her, Danelle, I need to go to the UN. I need, I've got to go to the UN and just see what's going on over there and see if there's something I can hunt down, you know. So I went over, we got a ticket into the third report of the SDGs. It was amazing, 10 days into, you know, connecting and chatting and listening and learning because I'm a great learner. I'm actually not a teacher as such. And I came back and I was, uh, oh gosh, can I say this? I was disappointed because I felt the beauty has, was missing. The rationale, the science, perfect. Best scientists in the world, but the love and the beauty was missing. And that's what I had during my childhood. So I went from love to rational, to, wow, what else am I looking for? Only to realise it was the balance. I want the balance. That's what I'm searching for. That's what I'm hunting down. In the UN at a library, I saw the word jurisprudence on a book and I thought that is the most beautiful word I have ever heard. I was just like, I was telling everybody about it. I came back, I did a presentation to manufacturers on it. I was just like, this is it. This is the new trend. This is the new word. And then I got an email that said, Earth Jurisprudence uh, course at Griffith University with Dr. Michelle Maloney. And I'm, there's another sign. Spirit has sent another sign. Go to the course. So I went to the course and, and went back to uni for a whole week. And Michelle introduced me to the great work by Thomas Berry. Probably the most beautiful book that I, I have personally read, only because the language, the energy behind it, the ethos, the philosophy embraces, embraces me, embraces me in my heart. And so Michelle said, I have thought this through and I have come up with a program called Green Prince that grounds the philosophy. I thought, brilliant, I'm on board. So we got together, we've still been together, we still like each other. So two and a half years later, and we are still trying to work out what we're doing. Uh, but I said, look, I've got Green Tag. Why don't we pilot your Green Prince program with Green Tag as a business? Now, we're a team of 12. We are tiny. We've got 12 in Brisbane, six overseas. So it's not the greatest business to do the pilot on, but what I have learned from the Green Prince project is that whilst we are out there saving the world, saving the globe, global green tag, we weren't anchored in our own community. We weren't anchored or nested in our own space of where we were working from. We were still in our head projecting out rather than as well as being anchored in our heart space, in our community, in our own bioregion. No consciousness of it at all, zero. So what I have learned is that we need to, as a company, ground ourselves back in our bioregion. We need to nest our business back in our own bioregion by learning about our bioregion. Now, are we grounding the business or are we grounding ourselves? Of course, we're grounding ourselves. The business is an entity, we're a species. So now we're on a journey of how do we do that? How do we actually anchor ourselves and nest as a business in a bioregion with a local ecosystem? And what we have, we, we have done a lot of work on that. I've learned a lot about Morningside, where the business is. And I know there's somebody here from the Bulimba catchment. Yeah, I've got to catch up with you. That'd be great. You're just down the road. Um, we've learned, yeah, learned a lot about the history. Didn't know anything about Morningside and its history. And the more I go into it, the more I anchor into the earth and the more energy I have. And the greater I contribution I think I'll, I'll be able to make now rather than the head one that was doing my 
whole body in. I, you know, it's like connecting it all up. Yeah, you understand, I know. So we're on that journey now to actually nest the business and nest us. And it is the point of difference I have noticed in the 200 sustainability framework that we've looked at. Somebody's on. There are 200 sustainability frameworks to choose from on the internet, from single issue carbon to, you know, many issues like, you know, global reporting index. None of them have this point of difference. And this is the point of difference that I'm noticing and learning and experiencing with Green Prints is that it's an anchor. Uh, and that's really, really where we're up to on it. It doesn't sound like much, but it's actually huge. It is actually huge to nest ourselves. We don't do anything in our local community, like tiddly swap. So we now need to do that. We need to contribute back to the ecosystem that is feeding us, that feeds our system, that feeds our, that feeds our business system, that you know, feeds the manufacturers. The other thing, and I agree with David Hood, is we need to educate. And for us, we have 150 global manufacturers that we work with, you know, Interface, Canalf, Lemonex, terrific, terrific leaders. And in September, the boards and the CEOs will be getting one of these books. And I'm going to highlight exactly what I want them to read. <laughs> And it'll just be the beginning of introducing the philosophy because that's how I started. I started with the philosophy. I picked up the new ball of energy and now I'll run with it and share it. That's all I'm doing is sharing. And then the invitation will be obviously to do a presentation to those boards or CEOs who choose to. It's that community of what we're calling the Global Ethical Manufacturers Group that we hope will come together and we will impact policy and law together. We're not going to do it on our own. We're not going to do that. It's got to be a collective effort because that's, that's the law of the universe that's up at the moment. <laughs> and if we violate that or we don't work with that, uh, it's just not going to happen. The other thing we're doing, and I'm learning through this with Michelle, is that there are earth leadership laws Somewhere, somehow this green prints thing is a bit of magic. There are laws within there that I believe could be collated and actually shared as well. Just the law of acknowledgement. One, the law of reciprocity, the law of partnership. There are many laws. I, I feel like there's an earth leadership package that could be put together that give the people the, 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 the bigger expansive energy and then they do the detail then they do the new frameworks because we don't have that umbrella. I don't feel like we have that umbrella, but I know the Indigenous have had it for many years. So that's all I need to share with you today. Um, but, you know, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Hey, thanks for listening and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Wonderful. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Oops, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Mary Lou. I invited Mary Lou not so much to bang the drum for green prints, although of course I'm delighted she is. Um, it's because pe pe people like Mary Lou who, you know, have been working in a space for a really long time and are still searching, I think they're kind of a gift in the corporate world because a lot of times people don't think that way. David's nodding. Um, and, if, and also just that notion of it is a big deal for non-Indigenous people to suddenly click to the fact that we have to get our feet on the ground our hands in the dirt and locate ourselves. Mary Graham says, you know, if there was um, an Aboriginal equivalent to the Descartes, I think, therefore I am, it would be, I am located, therefore I am. That's Mary Graham articulating as usual in a wonderful way to Westerners, what it means to really slow down, take time and live somewhere. So that's really what we wanted to end on today is that to us, Regen Brisbane, connecting with the sustainability work that's been done for decades, rethinking our economy, all of these things start with relationship. Um, and I love Mary Lou's idea about having an earth leadership pack for folks. And I would strongly recommend that we start with Mary Graham's work on the relationist ethos and the law of obligation, because 
Um, that's why we're writing that book together too. Maybe give me the date for September and I'll do a quick summary of, of Mary's work and make sure she endorses that. Um, because I, I do feel, and we do this governance analysis where we show earth jurisprudence, current Western legal thinking and Aboriginal law and philosophy and Aboriginal law and philosophy starts with first laws. The land is the source of the law and it's the template for our relationship with each other and with it. And then Earth Jurisprudence says, and it's just a, an old white fella talking about his old white fella system. And that's why it's powerful because it speaks to Westerners in a way that gets them to open up their minds. We never say that Thomas Berry is the answer of all things, but it speaks to Westerners in a way that does make sense to some. But even in, um, in Earth Jurisprudence, he talks about the great law, that human laws must be embedded into the kind of the living world and our laws should reflect the fact that we are part of this living world. We're just one member of the earth community. And then what's interesting is we've got this little table that Mary and I've developed. When you then go across to Western law, there is no first laws. There's no great law, there's no first law, there's no land ethic. It's a completely different system. I often say that Western law is just all second laws. It's just all about people interacting and treating the living world as if it's property, as if it's a bunch of furniture. And so that's the work that we're exploring. How do we bring the relationist ethos into the core and the center of our lives? And then how do we translate back out all of the activities we do and use all the awesome tools that people like Delwyn and Mary Lou and David and Marcus and all these great people have been developing for a long time. So it's to respect everyone's work, to do it in the right order and the rest we just make up as we go. Remember the little messy snail of destiny? To me, that's what it's all about, but we've got to keep going in a slithery fashion. So on that note, just a couple of things. Marcus, if you've got anything you want to wrap up with, do sidle up. We're going to let everyone go. Yes, absolutely. So for anyone who is joining us tomorrow, um, please rock up by just before 10 o'clock. It's going to be a much more relaxed day than today because we're just having um, a couple of folks leading us in some discussions. So please bring your masks and we'll take some space from each other. We start at 10 o'clock. For anyone who's not joining us, um, one thing that I'll be doing next week is putting together all of the recordings and presentations from today and sharing that. Um, we'll set it all up on the website and we'll also do a bit of a summary of not so much we did this and that, but what our next steps are so people can watch the videos and have a think. So the only thing I would finally say is a huge thank you. It has been weird and wonderful being back in a real live venue again. Thank you for your patience, your tenacity, um, and especially sitting through our me um, trying to grapple with weird technology. Um, and if we don't see you tomorrow, please stay in touch. If you've registered for today and you didn't just wander in off the streets, you're already on our mailing list. If you did just wander in off the streets, please send us your details and we'll put you on the mailing list. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, huge thank you to Marcus and Shelley and the QUT gang for getting this venue. Yay! <laughs> As someone who has grown an NGO from nothing, friends with venues for free has, has built Ayla. You know, it's only through people like Marcus who, as he said, use their um, position inside universities and other institutions that support us little guys. I'd also like to thank James and Christina who work with me in Ayla and put up with all my mad ideas. Thank you. Yay. And James for always rescuing me in moments of extreme terror. Other than that, Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow. Love your work. Yay, we're done. <laughs> Yay!